And hopefully that camera wind that it's going to be a very broad answer. Somebody is at home watching the video. I know that once you get to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Hey, you've got a full agenda tonight. Um, that being said, I appreciate everybody showing up. We can do a motion. Second. All right. Rick. All right. Let's see. Just, well, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for coming in tonight. There is a law that uh, says if you determine that you want to speak during the uh, program, you can sure pull your face mask down and talk. Uh, well, within the grounds of what the governor said is acceptable as it relates to the uh, face mask law. Hopefully at your desk in front of you, there should be three documents. The first would be an agenda. And uh, what follows the agenda, uh, we're actually going to be, with your authority after tonight's meeting, we're going to be posting that on our website and sending it out to families as uh, everything you want to know about uh, COVID-19 in the Minnewaska Area School District. So we've broken everything down by topic, and uh, for those families that are very interested in the details, they'll be able to read through that and keep it uh, uh, present so they can watch for things as we go on. The second thing that should be at your agenda is a quick reference guide. There's two pages to this, and the idea behind this is this will also be posted on our website, and uh, this is uh, everything you want to know about uh, COVID in the Mass School District, in Alaska School District, on a page on, with uh, information on both sides. So the print is small. There is a lot of information that summarizes what is in the, the former document that I referenced. And then also at your uh, tables should be an agenda that would follow the PowerPoint that we're going to go through tonight. So we just thought that there'd be a lot of information. I know you'll be able to see it fine on the screen up front, but I thought you might want to take it home, look at, look it over at your leisure. And uh, if you get calls from uh, 
say, constituents or stakeholders in the community, you'd be able to look, there'd be another document that you'd be able to look at in recalling uh, the program tonight we're going to go through. Uh, we have probably 10 different presenters that will be uh, here tonight, and uh, they're going to be coming in and out, and so we're going to be pretty efficient. We'll stop if you have questions to uh, uh, ask as we go along here. There are some of the slides that will have links that uh, Angie will move us to when we come to that, because there's a lot of detail, a lot more detail than we could put on a 30-slide PowerPoint. So if uh, you're okay, Chairman Chad, I'll go ahead and start through this. Proceed. Okay. So, all right. I think it's the present button. Mark, thanks. So it's not letting me uh, sign in. What's that yellow button? So it kills what you're saying. All right, with that in mind, there is uh, some confusion in the community because most of the school districts start school uh, the day after Labor Day, which would be September 8th. We want to just remind all our listeners and board members and everybody in attendance that we'll be starting school on Tuesday, September 1st. We also shared a document with you at our uh, last meeting that I'm not going to go through now for the sake of efficiency. But back on July 1st, the administrative team put together a planning calendar for the month of July. And it would, would actually bring us to uh, this date. And so I just want you to know that we haven't been shooting from the hip as we've gone along. We've been uh, here meeting almost daily uh, for a very full days since we started in July. And there are a lot more people who have been meeting with us and probably are gonna be in attendance at the meeting tonight. Just to review, uh, all of you had a chance to look at the governor's uh, executive order, but he, he said that he has three priorities. The first one had to do with the safety and health well-being of all of the constituents will be in school here. He also said that uh, we were supposed to be making data-driven decisions, leaning on science and research to make the best decisions for our state. So they have put together a lot of data, as you know, that we're expected to rely on. And then he also honored the uh, importance of every school district in the state being a local entity and that not one size fits all. So we have some liberties as an independent school district, as does every one of the other 330 districts around the state to make decisions that, that rely on science, rely on the recommendations, but also take into account where we're at as a, as a community and a school district. With that in mind, more getting more specifically now, he said that he's emphasizing local decisions that will be driven, not solely accountable to, but driven, informed by the data from the Department of Health and the Department of Education. He also said that uh, this should not be a decision that relies on uh, one or two people. There should be a team that's put together that they call the current incident command team and we anticipate that this team will be meeting weekly to interact with the uh, Pope uh, County, the Horizon Public Health, with the Department of Health. And uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, there will be a pretty broad-based team that we'll be hopefully bringing together to help make a decision. This committee will meet weekly, and uh, hopefully not for very long, we'll get into a routine over what is the information we're supposed to look at, and then uh, we'll we'll be able to make a decision for the next week in time. Uh, whatever we decide as a committee is gonna be uh, very important that we have to communicate it to the Department of Education, either the commissioner or the Department of Health, depending on if we're dialing back or, or uh, maintaining our current status. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've already seen it. But when we started on July 1st, we didn't have any of this guidance, as you know. And so we identified 11 parameters that I went through with you at the last board meeting. But uh, I just want to highlight four of them tonight. And one is that we will be relying on the, the Minnesota Department of Health and uh, Department of Education guidelines. And that's going to be really important, especially as it relates to the health-related issues that will be coming to the school each day. I mean, when you really think of it, we're, we're hopeful of having about 1,500 students or staff uh, blended together. And uh, there's going to be some protocol that everybody has to follow each day. We, we won't be making exception to that. One of the other things that you're going to hear about, I'm sure, because everybody in the state's hearing about it, is masks. Um, especially for the littlest of our kids, the, there are a lot of parents who are very concerned about kids wearing masks to school. We need to honor that and understand it. But I like how Megan Boutain, our, our, student, our uh, student health nurse, said it. We're going to be working with those students along the way to make sure they go from being perhaps uncomfortable to comfortable. It's not going to happen overnight, but it'll be part of the protocol we try to follow. Uh, this, the second thing is item number three. You're already very aware that we prioritized our youngest learners, and the idea was to have them all here, starting at the youngest ages and going up as high as we can. It turns out that we're going to be talking to you tonight about uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. So any elementary level students, kindergarten through sixth grade, either at Glenwood or in this building, will be uh, on site if our recommendation gets meets your authority every day. And uh, whether we're in hybrid or whether in, we're in what used to be kind of regular learning, we'll be explaining that. Uh, so we prioritize those kids. And then as the kids get older, uh, we know they're more independent. And so uh, uh, the youngest kids were prioritized. We also said we were going to rely solely on Corey Curry, our facility. Uh, director and Megan Boutin, the student health person to interpret the Department of Education, Department of Health guidance. And I just want to say before I get too far into this, that they have done an amazing job uh, helping our teams already move forward or navigate all the planning that we've done. So kudos to both of them and they'll both be presenting tonight. And then finally, we know that uh, our staff is going to be really asked now to spend three plates at once. We have to be able to be distance learning. We have to be able to be hybrid. We have to be able to do a newer version of the traditional. And so uh, we don't expect them to do that without support. And so uh, it was one of 11 parameters we identified in the very beginning. The return to school data that we have collected in our survey is going to be presented by Sarah. Um, and uh, Sarah did a, a great job of analyzing or bringing all the information together. But I also want to compliment the Minnewaska teachers. Uh, on August 4th, we had almost all of them here, and they participated in uh, uh, collecting information that covers about 1,200 of our students, and we're still doing some. But they did a great job of soliciting the questions and uh, uh, getting the data, which has been assembled by Sarah and some colleagues that she identified. All right. So our goal was to identify who was going to be in person, who was going to be uh, hybrid learning, or I'm sorry, that would be distance learning. Also to ask our families about some of the things from meals, transportation, um, and to understand their comfort level of coming back to school and returning to our buildings. And so we had probably a 12 question survey that was asked to all of our families. Um, and we received 1,198 students have responded. Um, and so we really, the other piece was we really wanted to educate our families of their options. The options have not always been the same where it's been traditional in-person learning. And we wanted them to know, um, even if you don't choose to be in person, you still have some options at Minnewaska. Lastly, we wanted to field some questions and see what the concerns were that were addressed and make sure that we can answer those and we can connect with families on a, a personal level. So when, when we started this, uh, 
we have 82% that are saying we're returning in person, whatever that in person is, whether that's hybrid learning or that is in person every day. 82% of our families said we are ready for that. 9.6% of our families are saying distance learning is the option that works best for our family, either for a medical need or we're just not comfortable. And then there are 8.3% that said that they don't have a preference. And so whether that's in-person learning or that is distance learning, depending on what the state tells us, is where they're falling. From that, we asked how comfortable are you? With the protocols and the pieces that we have in place, um, in-person learning will look different as students enter the building and they move about the building and so we shared that with families and we said that we're close to 80% that are comfortable or very comfortable with our uh, protocols and things that are in place. The 9% that are uncomfortable certainly is correlates directly with those that are choosing distance learning. We also asked about our before and after school care. We recognize that students, or families may choose this option if they wanted to have uh, less exposure on transportation or if they could drop students off in a before school care. Uh, that is not something that's been offered. The third one here, the after school care at the elementary school is the only thing that's been offered in our district recently. And so we tried to figure out what exactly families are looking for. We're seeing that the before school care at the elementary, so something starting around like 6.30 to 7.30, that is a, a uh, something that families would sign up for and pay through community ed would be something that would be a, uh, something that we would want to look into. We're recognizing that at the middle school with only seven interested, it's probably not as popular as it would be at the elementary. The after school care at the elementary certainly is still our largest group. And then the middle school, uh, we're having conversations about how would we start an after school care where families would be able to pick up their students. The students would have something to do at after school at the middle, and then also families would pick up by six o'clock. So it's very similar to the elementary situation. We asked families about their uh, bus services and what their plans are. Currently, we have 40% who say that tra Palmer transportation is not what they're looking for as they have their child uh, go to school, but we have almost 60% that are saying, yes, we will plan to use the bus services as we have. Sure, what's that typically? We had that conversation today, and we don't know that. Um, you know, if you go to the when I go to the next slide, it talks about you know the students that will drive to school, and that's fifteen percent. And so we're thinking that traditionally, that's probably so. If you go back, um, those that are not using the bus is probably more students that are not using the bus this year than previous years. But yeah, and we don't have that data from before, so I can't really answer that. But just uh, in regard to that question, though, I talked with Wyatt from the uh, Palmer Bus Company today. And now that we have this information, we're very concerned about making sure we can socially distance as best we can on buses. So we're thinking about reaching out to the family. We, we know who's been riding the buses, and we're considering doing another survey. It'd be a quick survey of do you need to ride the bus, or might it be that you could provide transportation uh, to school? So, I mean, they can say yes or no, but if, if they can provide some transportation, we could plan these routes a little differently than we will, you know, assuming that at least 60% of people want to As we look into other transportation options, should the bus not be an option for our families? At some point, 55% said that they can get their child to and from school. 15%, um, almost 15% drive already, and then there were about 14% that said we really have to have it. There are, you know, 13 other options here, so it, it shares with us that our survey has lots of other things in it, but those are the really big three. Food and nutrition, uh, we talked, they wanted to know a little bit more about how we, should we go into distance learning if families would be using the meal option and if they would like it delivered or if they would like to pick meals up. And so that shares a little bit more for us. It looks like the strong majority of our families, around 80%, um, are using the meal options. And that is it for surveys. Any questions on the survey information? Question on the first slide, we had roughly 110 kids then. We were talking about 9.6% of those responded. Well, they're families, but we don't know how many kids necessarily. Those are students. So roughly 110. Yeah. And as we went through the numbers, as we've gone through the rough data, 
it's about 110 students that we are seeing that are choosing the distance learning. Sure. Can you clarify? So you didn't get called yet. They did a call for students for example. So if you had two kids, <clears throat> the three had to answer the set of questions for each child in the family, not just the entire family. So that's why you get this harder number of kids. Right. So if you got called, you had to answer for both students, and then they entered them in separately. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Click me out of this, Andrew. Uh, we are so in this document. We just want you to know as we move forward. Now we're going to talk. Each each principal will be coming up, and they'll be talking about each one of these different models at their sites. So uh, we'll start with Scott, the elementary school principal. Good evening, board members. Um, so we wanted to give you an update on where we're at in our planning from the elementary school level. Um, we've met as a building leadership team, I think, four or five times now um, that we met again today. And um, according to the, the data that we currently have from the county, we are planning to start school in person for grades E through three at our building. And really excited about that because I think that um, one of the things that was really important to us was that we at least be able to start the year with all of our kids in, in, in front of us. I think that that uh, allows us to start the year um, creating as many of those normal memories we can for the beginning of a school year for children. Um, so if you look up here at the slides, um, things that we're doing within that, you know, we're going to be face to face, but we are still going to be doing things recommended by MDH to be able to keep um, you know, exposure at a minimum. So we have staggered arrival and release. Um, arrival kind of staggers itself from what I understand because our buses arrive at different times and, uh, and our students are dropped off at different times. But in the afternoon, we are going to have to have somewhat of a staggered release to make sure we're not putting kids out um, in large groups together. We are going to have temperature uh, stations at our two main entrances, the main uh, door one, as well as over at our EC, SC early childhood door. And those are, I think you've been uh, brought to speed on those, but we're going to have two of the, the face reading kiosks where students will be able to look into those and immediately get their temperature read. We will probably also have handhelds um, as well so that we can move kids along in as expedient a fashion as possible. Social distancing under this model will be used wherever possible. We're not required under the face-to-face uh, in-person -face model to do the full six feet, but wherever we can, we're certainly going to try to do that. Um, anywhere where we can, can keep kids safer is going to be better. Our cafeterias under uh, the current plan, we will be planning to run at approximately half capacity, and I, I mean half capacity according to what we would normally do for lunch. It's actually well under half capacity to the room. Um, but we're looking at being able to actually do one grade level at a time and hopefully be able to have kids sit um, with a seat between them as they eat lunch so that we're um, limiting exposure in that way. And then recess would also be scheduled to limit unnecessary exposure as much as we can. Um, and then, of course, cleaning between lunches and recesses of any of the, uh, the, you know, the playground equipment outside and the, the tables inside and things of that nature. We're also planning on during worksheet, uh, workshop week, teaching all of our staff um, the ways that they can be involved in the cleaning process too. We don't think it's it's viable to expect that our custodial staff alone keep up with the day-to-day -day just momentary needs. So we're going to train staff so they can move on the fly and clean things as they go. Uh, with this model and all models, um, Sarah just shared the data, about 10% of our families at the elementary E for three level roughly um, said that they planned that they would be um, doing distance learning. Um, in kindergarten, that was the smallest. I think so far we had four confirmed families that said that they would not be arriving in person. And then a little bit higher at the other levels. 
And so um, that being the case, we are going to, the model that we are choosing to focus on those learners with, we, we looked at models where we would have um, camera, like a camera in the room filming the instruction and things like that. And in the end where we landed, we just didn't feel like that was um, a reasonable expectation that a kindergarten learner would be able to track with an, an online class in person for an entire school day. You can imagine about five, ten minutes into that where those kindergartners are going to start to get, you know, focused on other things. So we are actually going to try to, to um, repurpose staff from within our building to be able to provide a teacher that is focused on the online learners specifically so that they can um, help those kids and focus specifically on their needs. Um, and then um, we're going to go to the hybrid if you want to. Thank you. If we are required to go into a hybrid model, um, we are still going to maintain, going back to the, the non-negotiables, we are still going to maintain all of the elementary C through three students in our building daily, and that that will be accomplished by, um, by reducing our capacities of our classrooms. And what that'll look like, I was actually meeting with the building leadership team today. We were looking at all the spaces in the building, and we actually we have a, a contingency map created for if we go into that that version of hybrid learning where each of the classrooms would be we would utilize larger spaces such as our cafeteria and gym spaces to spread kids out and be able to have classes in safe six foot distancing areas we would also have classes that we would separate into two adjoining classrooms and have a teacher paired with a para or another uh, teaching staff to be able to conduct class in both locations at the same time and keep those numbers down, but not have to interrupt learning for our youngest kids. Um, I'm just gonna see if there, lunch would be in the classrooms under that model because we would be utilizing our cafeteria space. Um, we also felt like in a hybrid situation, that's probably the safest for our kids uh, because it would limit their exposure to only the kids in their class. We would also be using a grab and go breakfast. And so uh, just a couple of things that I wanted to highlight that go with that. Um, to be able to, to take, uh, meet the needs of those online learners for those young students who really do need a specific teacher and um, to also be able to, to flex with the needs of hybrid and in-person learning, we felt that we would need a uh, half-time FTE elementary teacher. Um, we would probably have more than one teacher honestly focusing on the in-person or the, the distance learning. But, um, but we can't repurpose all the staff within the building to do that. We feel like we would need to have a half-time teacher. What we would look at doing with that position is having that person be uh, full-time every day for a half a year so that we could get the year running and have all of our needs covered. And then we could reevaluate as the year goes on and decide is that still a financial, um, a financial um, expenditure that we feel like is serving our students well and that we feel like we need and that we can reevaluate and go forward from there. We would also need a 1.0 FTE paraprofessional because just to spread the kids that thin throughout the building requires, we can't leave a child in a room alone without an adult. So we have to have enough adults to cover that. And I feel like if we had one more paraprofessional that we can cover that. And that's my, my part of the presentation. What questions do you have? Yeah. If you are, uh, if some of the classrooms aren't the same size, and you said you might have to have one class in or one class in two different rooms, would that class maybe have less kids or more kids depending on the room size? You know what I mean. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So in some cases, by I would say most of our classes, and by class I mean you know the whole class not divided in half most of our classes will be pretty close to the same number there are a couple locations we have one kindergarten room where i feel we could safely distance students and have one teacher but we wouldn't be able to have let's say over 20 kids in that room so we would um, based on the square footage we would have to reduce that to maybe 16 to 18 kids in that room but most of the rest of our rooms we're either taking the same size class and splitting it between two rooms or we have a room large enough like the cafeteria where we're able to have the room be pretty close to the same size but just more distanced. That determination between in-person and hybrid is that's based on your weekly meetings you want to come in? Yes. Okay. And, uh, 
we have to give we have to give proper notice. So it might be a day that it takes us to make that change. Sure. But um, he's set up right now to have all the kids in attendance in either one or yeah. the other yeah. program. You just have to set up the teaching classroom. Yeah. And then along those lines, could you also mention the a couple of the uh, physical things that you're going to need? Uh, sure. To divide them. So if we end up in a in a dist or a hybrid learning model um, to be able to create classrooms, we we don't want that to suddenly become um, sterile and you know we're still dealing with primary age learners. So some of the things that we would need to do, and we um, we've been uh, working with uh, American and other places to to be able to get things like we would need. Uh, there are large room uh, portable dividers that can actually be spread out. They cover approximately a 20 foot span and they're about six feet high. So I can take uh, one of those and put it in one half of our gymnasium. That would allow a teacher to be able to um, have two different groups going, one on each side. So it gives you a little bit more social distancing ability, but it also, um, it also makes it so that it's a wall that we're not building permanently and putting lots of money into that we're going to take down down the road. So it, it, we're going to have to have about four of those. And then we're also looking at adding some rugs. I've been working with Corey as well as um, um, with the process of ordering some more rugs so that in those spaces, because they're tile floors or they're wood floors, you would want to have you know uh, floors that are carpeted and friendly for students to be able to sit on and things like that. So those are some expenditures I think that we would have to be prepared for knowing that if we ended up in hybrid, everybody would probably be wanting those same things really fast. Uh, no, that's a great question. The extra needs, the 0.5 teaching staff would be for the in-person model as well because we, we anticipate based on the survey data that about 10% of our students based on what their families said will be doing the distance learning even if we're in an in-person model. So we'll have to teach all of our normal classes but we'll also need to account for those kids too. So if you went to the hybrid, you're saying you could put kindergarten, like you said, instead of having 24, you'd have 18 or 16, say five kids out of that class, and that figure to a different room because of the spacing needs. That teaching those children, right? Where the other classroom would already capacity to teach that. So I sat down um, with our, first of all, with our building leadership team, and then subsequent to that with, um, with a couple of our special education staff and what we looked at was our current para staffing and what our one-to-one -one para needs are and then based on that because I can't I can't have someone covering half a classroom if they're one-to-one -one with a student because they need to be able to be focused on that student so um, that was part of the decision of where people were placed if we're in the hybrid model is based on if they have to have a para in that room and how many and so um, if we take a class and we split it between two classrooms let's say there's 10 and 10 in two adjoining rooms the there would be a team of a licensed teacher and a paraprofessional or another staff member and they would be working as a team so basically where the teacher might be next door in room a teaching the, the whole group reading lesson while the group next door is doing centers, center time, you know, with, doing read to self, read to a partner, those types of things next door with the para. And then the teacher would switch and be teaching the other group. Um, and, uh, and so, but the, unfortunately, we obviously we can't, for safety reasons, leave those children in that room next door without an adult, you know, uh, for liability reasons. And that's where the para piece comes in. What we can add to that, Nick, is that. Uh, that, that paraprofessional will be a paraprofessional, but there'll be an adult that's been authorized now by the, by the state licensing department to actually be in that room. That person can't do grading, that person can't plan the lesson, but they could work alongside a teacher together and make sure that both, both groups are served uh, and that was in, in hybrid. And I would add to that too, I want to make it very clear that, that that would be my expectation that I would be explaining to our staff as well, that the, the paraprofessionals are not going to be supplanting teachers. They're, the teacher's role is going to remain to plan the instruction, 
But just like what happened in a regular classroom, we'll be facilitating what a paraprofessional is doing to support kids. We're going to do that across two rooms. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here. So at the middle school, it's a little bit different. We have students that are in both the K-6 and then also in the 7-8. And so we're planning a little bit differently on both sides of that. Working closely with Scott and what the expectations are for K-6 and then also closely with Nate and what the expectations are for 7-12. Um, we have kind of created some protocols so that families are well aware of what happens when you enter our building, what does it look like. As Scott shared, currently with the data, it looks like K-6 would be in person and 7-12 hybrid. The hybrid at the um, at the elementary side, the four through six, is that students would be in person and they would either move to larger spaces with throughout the building or they would also have their classrooms split, just, just like you heard from Scott. We have a few larger spaces and so I think we're almost half and half of where our students go. Half of them move to a larger space and half of them split. Um, the larger space that allows for one teacher to be there where the split as you had, as you talked to earlier, is just the two people, both the paraprofessional and the classroom teacher. Uh, the seven eight hybrid is an A B day, and so students would that are here would participate. If you will go by last name or by family, and so if you are an A student, you would come on Mondays and Thursdays. If you are a B student, you would come on Tuesdays and Fridays, and then Wednesdays would be distance learning. The days that you are not in session would be distance learning from home. And so when we talk with families or with teachers about this, we talk about planning a week in advance. So what does it look like that you need to work on through the week? And what are the things that could happen at home that family that students could participate in? And what are the things that need to happen in person? And so um, teachers are really working toward trying to wrap their brain around how does my instruction change and what does that look like? We're in tomorrow morning or tomorrow all day with teachers and really the lion's share of the time is work time on things like that because it's certainly a shift in what the way that we've been educating kids. Um, as students enter and exit the building, they have very similar experiences as Scott shared. They walk in and there's a kiosk where that will take their temperature. Students will um, have hand sanitizer and they'll have a grab and grow breakfast and move into their classrooms earlier than what they have in the past, certainly. Uh, they'll start class at 8 o'clock in the 4 through 6 and 8.15 in the 7 and 8. And go through go about their normal day. Um, as they exit the building, there's certainly, we have some staggered uh, exit times and staggered times that classes will end. And then they have certainly doors that they are going through depending on grade level. So there's door 4 is for 4 through 6, 7, 8 goes out door 3. Then our 9 through 12 exits out of um, door 2. And so we really tried to identify how do we get them in, how do we use our cafeteria. I'll go through the list here. It's a little different on mine. But um, assessments are certainly, I talked about hybrid, so assessments are certainly something that we will continue. We're really interested in saying where are students at? What did they learn at the end of last spring? What did they retain through the summer? And where are we and what do we need to do to fill holes and gaps? Taking that a step farther as our teachers meet tomorrow, they're really talking with teachers from last year to talk about what are the things that we know maybe we need to spend a little bit more time focusing on as we enter into the fall. Uh, schedules and bells, I shared with you the hybrid schedule, but it's a traditional schedule when we're in person. Um, we won't have a bell system, we're gonna try it without, and so we have a little bit of difference in passing times between the, the 9-12 and the 7-8. We're gonna work and see how, within a few minutes, how that all works. Currently, what we know in a high school, 7 through 12 is there's about 270 students I take that back. There would be about 250 students that would be passing through our hallways at one given time uh, throughout the building. Classroom spacing, this is, we're really just asking okay, classrooms to move students apart. And so if we're in the in-person model, there's not a guarantee that they're six feet apart, but that they are spread apart as we can throughout the classroom. When we're in a hybrid model, it's required that there are six feet of different of distance between them. And so we're talking about how do classroom how are classrooms set up. You've all been in them, and right now um, we have a lot of group work and a lot of partner work and a lot of kids at tables. And so we're trying to say how does that look different as we go through the school year. We've talked a little bit about absenteeism and how do we move in and out of distance learning. 
Absenteeism, we recognize that students will be ill or that they might be gone for a day. A day does not necessarily move them into distance learning. But if there is something that they would show symptoms or signs of COVID or have an exposure and need to be um, quarantining, that we would work with them and their family and how they move into distance learning and then when they're safe to return to school and how that looks. And so if a family um, needs that, we certainly through our office will connect with them and work through that. And so that if they are healthy at home, they're able to still attend school. Lockers, uh, as we move about the school, um, I'm not sure where this is at, but as we move about the school, Traditionally, in seventh and eighth grade, students from all different classes move from one class into the next class with all different students. And this year, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Our students are going to be in pods, and so who they go to class with for their first hour will be all with them throughout the day. There are a couple of um, nuances in the schedule that we are going to have a little bit of change and shift with that in, but for the most part, our students will all be together throughout the day in their pod very similar to what you have had and experienced in K through six. Lockers will be arranged that way as well, so students won't interact with others uh, that are not part of their pods at this point. We have said that if we get to January at semester time and we can make a shift in that, we certainly would look to it, but this is how our first semester will start. As we look at moving in the cafeteria and recess, our cafeteria, if we're in person, we recognize that it is important for our students. Uh, usually that's a very bustling time, or busy place and very bustling during lunch times. And so there's typically about 300 students that eat in there every day. And so, or, I'm sorry, every hour that is a feeding time. So what we will do is that in-person learning will allow for two thirds of our cafeteria to be full. And we have some overflow seating in various spaces, including our small gym. If we are in hybrid, we only, I believe it's around uh, 62 to 65 students that are allowed to sit in there that are distanced apart. And so we will really depend on um, alternative eating spaces for our students. Recess for identifying certain locations that our students can be in watching uh, what those numbers, uh, students will still have recess at the same time, but watching what those numbers can be in, they need to be in small groups or they can um, at some points be together and running around as they're outside. Distance learning, uh, certainly there's the optional distance learning and students that choose to do that will be part of, at the four through six, they'll be part of a classroom and they will have, um, a, a, the classroom will have a paired teacher and so you may have reading with one teacher and math with the other and then reading with the other teacher again. And so there could be a potential of two teachers that you would be having that would check in with you throughout the day. Um, at the high, or at the seventh and eighth, we will have distance learning would include students that they'll be on an A, B schedule. So on the A days, if you're an A student, you'll be required to jump in to class as you would if you were in person. On the B days, you would have the at home or the hybrid instruction and the things to complete following the A day. After school programming is something that we're looking to add to the middle school. We certainly saw from families that that's something that could support them uh, if they had after school programming in this building alone. And so uh, we're looking to build that in this fall and see where that goes and takes us. A quick question. Uh, I'd also like to request board members if you have questions, use the microphone. You can all hear it here. Unfortunately, I'm recording it. You might not see it. Um, now now we've brought up the whole uh, thing about the gates in this section. We have Monday, Tuesday classes, Thursday night classes, Wednesdays is school day. Right? Correct. Um, and the understanding that we're having groups, we're having pods, a pod, a pod. Has there been some consideration in having a being on Monday and Tuesday, and then cleaning, and then B being on Thursday, Friday, so you actually don't have any cross kind of I'll say cross contamination. Some type of cross seating with not having to be clean the day on Wednesday. We have had numerous conversations about that and what that looks like. One of the things that we're recognizing is that we really want to see our students and in person and how important that is, that we want to see them twice a week. And we know that if they're struggling on Monday, Tuesday, it's three, if they're struggling on Monday, it's three days until we see them to be able to support them with the needs that they may have. And so we recognize that the contamination piece or the students being in, but also recognizing that we think it's really important that we see our students at different times throughout our week so we can support them as best as we can. Thank you.
So later on in the presentation, we have Corey here, and he's going to talk about what deep clean is. But we're, we're trying to balance, it, and when Sarah says they've kicked this around about every which way you can, they, they have. We've gone from, they've actually been talking not only at Sarah's level, but at Nate's level also about A, 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 and then B, B. And they looked at, but then we've got kids that are not in school for five days, you know, because they 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 might be in school Friday, but they won't be there on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And they talked about continuity of learning, and where the staff is at this point is, and and maybe we should even take the time to explain a little bit more how the how it would be A L and M through K or M through Z. Or whatever so we break that down by family because that's a big component too so everybody in the family comes in at a day but what why don't you just take a little more time sarah and, and explain the nuances of the, how you ended up with a b and right so on so we've gone back and forth on this numerous times and so um there's been lots of good conversation about how we do that if it should be a a if it should be b b if we should have block schedules, if we should go through the seven period day, if we should add an eight period day. Um, there have been all kinds of options here and all kinds of meetings around this. And what we figure, what we find is that if we believe that what we have our students doing now is what is meant for Minnewaska students to have to graduate and to be successful in life. And so we don't want to, we're not straying far in adding a class and saying we're adding something that is not something that's required for you to or for teachers to prep for or for you to graduate uh, we've also gone into again that a b piece of do we we go a a and b b but again when we're trying to balance what students need we're really going through and saying okay they need to be in what we saw last spring is that if students got behind after one day or two days it really they got behind for a long time and it really took a long time to catch them back up and so using that experience and what we recognize for our student needs we said no nope, it's more important to have a day and b day and then having a, a day at home and then a day and b day and so that's where we came up with that um, it has been a conversation that's gone back and forth between my building leadership team as well as Nate's and they've met together for a little while as well trying to all sit around the table and have that conversation about what makes the most sense and where are we. I also want to add that uh, we, we don't claim to have this thing wrapped up in a nice box with a big bow on it. And some of the things that you guys are identifying right now will be maybe something that we have to think about moving to as we move through this also. I think if, if Corey's here, Corey, Okay, if you want to come up just for a minute, and I think it'd be important to identify what deep cleaning is, because there's hundred different uh, versions of what that could look like. But right. if you don't mind sharing, right? What, uh, what, what what I'm going to say is uh, the uh, traditional cleaning. We're going to go through the rooms. We're going to uh, clean all the surfaces. Uh, we're going to take out the garbages, vacuum floors, all that stuff. Deep cleaning. We're really going to wash down surfaces. Now, this is part of what I'm going to talk about coming up here is that teacher participation is going to be critical in, in getting this stuff done. Um, if we can count on them to do some uh, washing down of the surfaces, the desktops, the counters uh, at the end of the days, we can then come through and do the uh, disinfecting later on that night. Um, the idea of the A, B distance learning on Wednesday and a deep clean. Um, we're we're focusing on every night too. Uh, the, the Wednesday being a deep cleaning day is a big advantage uh, to get some of the other areas. But with the staffing that we have currently, uh, we will we we need to do it that Wednesday to catch up on some areas that we're not going to be able to get. Now every area will get disinfected, uh, but some of the 
some of that washing down will not occur probably until Wednesday. Okay, you have a question? Yes, sir. Quick one, that's your is Wednesday app is in a hybrid model, correct? No, Wednesday app is in the hybrid model for the 712. It is not in the hybrid model for the K6. We'll still be there K6 will continue to be here five days a week. As well as students that are on an IEP, they may have, if they are in 712 and they're on an IEP, they may have the ability to come five days a week as well. Okay, so in the current planning, so he was talking about, as it stands right now, that won't have anything three in person. As, as the plan right now. Did you say that the 4 6 is the plan right now? Well, correct. We are looking at our elementary being identified as it previously has been. So K through 6 would be in person, 7 through 12 would be hybrid. So at the middle school, we're split, but 4 through 6 would be in person, 7 8 would be hybrid. Just start right now. Right. Based on the current numbers, that's what it appears to be. That was, if we're not going to have 9 12 building, regardless. Don't we have enough room in this building then to not do it necessarily a hybrid where they're not here five days a week? If we've got extra classrooms that aren't going to be utilized to get the numbers, if we're doing something like that, why can't we have seven and eight here five days a week in their pod and small lab sizes because we have physical space? The 912 is here during that time. So the 912 will be in hybrid as well. Well, they said seven eight is going hybrid. 712 will go That's hybrid. Yep, so the 712 will all be here in hybrid model on an AB schedule. So, Nick, that, that's a really good question, and that's kind of how we started the conversation. We were going to go kindergarten through how far up can we go. But once we get to the seventh grade, we, we're starting to share staff between the two. Say, we have a science teacher that's got to teach a couple sections of middle school as well as high school. And it became a quagmire of how to do all of that. So that's why the 712 is grouped together in the hybrid model as well. It's it's a house of cards when it comes to staffing. And if I could just uh, comment on what Corey mentioned, like I, I've been trying to drive this idea that all hands on deck means, you know, they don't I don't need to have the maintenance guys come in and clean the district offices every day. We can take our own garbage cans, we can dump, we can do what we need to with recycling. We, we want to make sure that the maintenance staff has a priority on doing what they can to disinfect as often as they can. Well, I think the same thing could be true of our classrooms. If our, if our teaching staff can help with some of those little things that right now maintenance guys are doing, they'll free them up to do some of the other work that's got to be done. And and the staff's been wonderful about saying, yeah, that all makes sense. So it'll be kind of a repurposing of duties for a lot of people to a certain extent. Do we have any other questions? Appreciate it, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. We have Ethan Stein from Horizon Public um, Health is online and she's going to talk to you a little bit about how this information is coming to you from the government. Yeah, let's do that. Are we connected with the site?
Yes, I'm gonna just call Ann, and if she could, if I can get her on. Ann is on. Oh, there she is. Uh, okay. Okay. Ann, can you hear us? I mean, she's on. Yes, I'm on. Can you hear me? Great. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks for joining us, Ann. And uh, we're in session. I don't know if you can see us, but uh, we're in the process of going through what our plans are for uh, depending on which scenario that we're in. And I had an interesting conversation with Ann a few nights ago about the information and the role that Horizon Public Health will be playing, guiding schools, uh, at least in Pope County and actually in five different counties in the geographic area. So Ann, if you could just give us an overview of you know, what, what your hope is with this and how the information comes to you and how you might see us working together, it would help our board understand globally more, uh, or from a global perspective, all of the information that we're gonna to get to consider in making these weekly decisions. Absolutely. Um, are you able to hear me okay? Yes. I'm just not? Okay, great, great. Well, thank you. Um, I'm the administrator for Horizon Public Health, and we are basically Pope County's public health department. Um, six years ago, Horizon was formed and it has joined um, five counties together into one um, integrated health department. So I suppose in a school district um, um, thought it is, it's a little bit like consolidating um, school districts. So we do serve um, five counties and that's Douglas, Stevens, Traverse, Pope and Grant County. Um, so we really can be thought of as your Pope County Health Department, but there's actually um, additional resources that we've been able to leverage this way. Um, and I think our boards would say they, they think it works pretty well. Um, this is certainly a new role for us. We are, we are wanting to be available for consult. Um, and so we have been reaching out um, and it's part of the reason I'm here tonight and um, wanting to be, make sure that we're available to you as you need. Um, probably one of our bigger roles that we have played um, through the course of this pandemic is we've been doing um, a lot of public information, but we have um, most specifically since the middle of May, we have been the arm of the Minnesota Department of Health doing um, case, uh, case investigations and contact tracing. And so that does give us um, um, sort of boots on the ground knowledge of how things are working. We do have um, registered nurses that are functioning in that role. So if someone does have um, a positive COVID um, test result, one of our staff is working to get in touch with them within 24 hours and to perform um, an interview, help answer questions, those kinds of things, and then complete the contact tracing. Um, doing a lot of coordinating with healthcare and other types of partners and resources. And so we're certainly anticipating that our role with schools um, will become greater over time. We do have a dashboard that is available through our website. So if you just search for Horizon Public Health um, and you find our website, there is a data dashboard. So you can get to the local data that um, related to our five counties. And on there, you will be able to find um, a case curve that is specific for um, Polk County. So you can see literally how the curve is going and you'll be able to see um, when cases, uh, cases started to take off. So uh, currently in Polk County, we have uh, 48 cases and we have six active cases. Uh, you'll be able to see as you look at that data that their activity has really picked up here um, in Polk County since July. And you'll be able to see the dates that cases are reported and how many um, if you just hover over that. And the active cases are the cases in Polk County at, um, at the time that the dashboard is updated. It's the number of people, um, cases that are supposed to be home and on isolation during that time. And because of some testing and some other reporting data that isn't always going to match up um, as the cases are reported and coming in because sometimes there's some delays in testing or maybe somebody had um, symptoms for quite some time before they went in and got tested. Um, 
We are working with the Minnesota Department of Health um, related to data and we're hoping that we will, they just published some zip code data late last week. Um, it is for cumulative cases so far. I'm hoping that we will soon have zip code data that would be um, more related to act current activity and what's happening. Um, and I can see that they have put up on the screen. Um, you will see this is the 14 day case rate by county. So there on the bottom, you will see um, Polk County's case rate. And as you can see for the last um, three weekly cycles, these are two week timeframes, but they shift by one week as they move along. And so very little activity um, in, uh, um, in the early stages, but in Polk County, it has uh, picked up here since um, uh, since June 28th. That is the 10.93 number, and the last one, 11.84, is between July 12th and July 25th. Those dates, um, that date range, it might seem like, well, July 25th was a little bit ago, and it was, um, but that is the date that the specimen was collected. And so um, those cases don't get reported out. In some cases, they are having to wait, unfortunately, right now, um, anywhere from three, four days to potentially um, eight. And in some parts of the state, depending upon where those labs are going, they could be even further out. And so they're working on that. Um, but it is uh, that, that data is getting published on Thursday um, every week. And this is available out on the Minnesota Department of Health website. There are a number of nuances with the data. Um, they are trying to make sure that, uh, that ca the cases have um, correctly been assigned to the county. Uh, that's particularly important in counties with not real large populations, um, as each case can have a significant impact on, um, on where rates are. Um, they are also making sure that it is a deduplicated um, count. We are not encouraging multiple tests after someone has been tested positive. In fact, we're discouraging that, but in case for some reason that happened, um, they're doing that as well. I am not able to get the exact um, numbers and things and to be able to completely replicate it locally, although we can estimate. Um, and so I did have a staff member do that again this morning, and it is looking very similar to um, to the rate that was through the 25th. Uh, at our current time, things are looking somewhat similar. So that does give you kind of a, a place to uh, look at your planning. And certainly it sounds like you have been doing that. There is Minnewaska. Uh, Minnewaska related to the type of, um, the type of uh, policy option that you would be looking at during that time. Um, I think one of the things that we'll wanna be doing is if for some reason, um, Polk County, your district is rather central um, in the middle of the county and serves um, quite a broad area of the county. But if, for example, we did see a cluster that we could identify that was very specifically in an area of the county, um, uh, maybe it was a farm um, operation or something, for example, and we knew that that was, um, was connected to Benson um, and not to Minnewaska, that might be something that we would have some conversation as we would go about. Um, we are seeing that the majority of our cases, um, a third of them are between people the ages of 21 to 30. Um, we've been fortunate to not have a lot of elderly so far, which is very fortunate, but we're hoping that we can keep it that way. Um, and most people are, uh, quite a number of people, 26% have known where their exposure was that's a known contact uh, with a case. And so they've known to get tested. We have had about 15% of our cases have been asymptomatic, meaning they have not had any symptoms. Um, and we would expect, you know, we definitely expect to see that, but we aren't, um, it's a good indicator that there are certainly, we know that there are people out and about with, with that don't have symptoms. Um, but as well, when, um, when you don't maybe know that you potentially would have been exposed, um, there probably are a number of people that are, um, that are asymptomatic that are have not been tested. Um, so Anthony, with that, so um, yes. So I just want to, you know, we're, we're getting kind of our first run of looking at some of this information, although the information on the on our screen has been there, as you can see from back in May. Yes. Um, so the, the uh, control team that we're forming is gonna have 10 or 12 14 people on it 
from all different uh, venues. And uh, we're wanting to know how, how will we work with you then? Will we just access this information and you'll give us this number, we'll apply it to this chart that we're looking at now. And in our case, if we were 11 or 12, you can see that we would be in the uh, elementary would be in person, middle school, high school would be in hybrid because we fall in this chart on a 10 to 20 basis. But right. what we're wanting to do is use all the data, which but we don't know what that's going to be. As an example, it's got to be more than this number, but if we knew it as an example that all of our cases were in a rest home, as an example, that, that might cause us to say, you know, we can be in-person learning, you know, all the time. Or if we happen to know that we get a number of eight or nine, let's say, but it's in the school age population, you know, five to uh, whatever it is, 18, I think, is what the other charts show, then we might want to be more conservative. So this number that we're looking at is just one piece of information that we're to look at. Is that your understanding? Um, yes, it's um, our understanding is this is supposed to be the starting point. Um, and then we're supposed to really work together as well as with the Minnesota Department of Health. And I believe the Minnesota Department of Education as well. If you are, if, if um, your school district is interesting in pursuing something that is different than what the data would be telling you. Um, one of the things that we can offer is, is um, sort of that lens of um, we're not going to be able to share much, but we certainly could share um, information to say, you know what, we're generally seeing that this is this is just general community transmission going on. Um, so the rate is is pretty, um, it, there probably isn't anything from, as you were saying, there isn't an unusual situation. But if we were to have an outbreak um, in a business operation or in a, um, in a long-term care setting or something like that, we would want to look at that and see, did we think that there would be some application and impact related to the school or not with that? Um, we don't have epidemiologists here at Horizon Public Health. That is really very typical across, um, across the state, really only the largest health departments in the metro area and probably in the Rochester area have that type of expertise on staff. So we are also your link to the Minnesota Department of Health and we can be helping to talk with someone who has really done a lot of study related to um, school age children, looking at the research, what's ha what they're finding happening in other parts of the world, other parts of our country, um, as they continue to learn about, um, to learn about this, uh, about this virus. So we certainly can do that. Um, I want to be available from the standpoint of for school administration um, and uh, have been working to um, try to be as responsive as we can. We do have a, a, one of our nurses, uh, we have a nurse actually assigned to every school district across our, um, across our five schools and they're working to make contacts um, within the schools as well. And so if you need somebody um, that might be more uh, what I would call boots on the ground type of person to be on a team or something. We could certainly look at that or, um, or I can try to join. Um, we're really just trying to figure out what each school um, needs. This is a little new for us and we want to be sure that we can provide that, um, provide that, um, that assistance in whatever way makes sense. Each district is a little bit different. Um, and unique, and so we're we're certainly interested in learning what is helpful for you. Um, and I think we also will be needing to have some good contact as the school year begins and gets started, um, as there might be exposures and as there might be cases and kind of working through some of those uh, pieces. We are expecting some detailed exclusion guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health. I have not seen that published yet. But, um, but that is another scenario where I think um, there's sort of this data that comes out every week and I'll continue. It's available out on the MDH website, but I will continue to send that on to administrators and, and school folks as well. And, uh, but also providing um, some nursing um, assistance as well and connections with our case investigation uh, team here when needed and appropriate. Well, Anna, I think what we're going to need as we go is somebody to be a representative on the team that uh, the school board will ultimately decide upon. 
but it's we're really going to have to push the Department of Education to allow us access to the most informative information. And it's troublesome to me that we start school in a couple weeks and uh, we haven't gotten any guidance even what this team is supposed to look like. So we just have a spirit here of involving everybody. But as soon as you get that information or if you could pressure the Department of Health to get going with it because schools are starting, uh, it would be helpful. And we'd, we'd be very supportive of you doing that. Uh, because otherwise it just looks like we could look at a number on a sheet of paper and consider that with whatever information that we're going to have. But what's interesting is maybe what else you can provide so we know where are the cases, not who has them, but where are they. And, and then that can help our committee make some assessment about the next week. So uh, <clears throat> whatever you can do to pass that on uh, or let me know what we can do to pass it on would be greatly appreciated. Well, I'll certainly, I have been in, um, um, trying to advocate uh, up with uh, the Minnesota Department of Health and I will continue to do that. Um, we, I think um, I think we're all a little bit in the situation of trying to figure this out um, as we're trying to build the boat and, and uh, move everything forward in lightning speed. And so um, I, I can absolutely appreciate um, the challenges that, uh, well, I can't because I, I don't I don't uh, I don't operate a school. I, I imagine there are many many challenges to this, um, and it looks like you've got some great people working on planning, and and we want to support you in whatever way we can, and we're trying to get the information as well so that we know um, and have the guidance that um, on, on you know some of those technical kinds of things that we really haven't um, received yet as well. So, okay, Director Ragland, do you have questions for this time? Uh, I guess I don't know if this will be directed to anybody or anybody. What what is our population that we use? Is it you know I'm kind of hearing it's kind of the county, but it's kind of not. If you're in the corner and you're going to Morris, what number do we use? So, so if, if you're asking how the rate is calculated um, for Pope County, they are using a population of eleven thousand two hundred and forty eight. That was the number that the health department gave me that they're using. Um, just because there are some slight variances depending upon where you might be getting a population number, but that is what I've been told they're using for Polk County. Okay, and then uh, we have 48 positive cases in Polk County now up to this point. How many tests have been conducted? Mm. Let me look and see if that, that number is um, in a document that I have access to. I can look that up and let me just see here. And you know, then my question starts to go to how, how dynamic are we going to be? And then my mind goes to, uh, you know, a lot of it is asymptomatic. And uh, so just, just imagine the science teacher was with somebody over the weekend. The somebody ends up becoming positive. That was Saturday night. Now it's Wednesday. They're positive. Somebody is positive. Now the science teacher is in the look back circle. You know, how does that go? I mean, do we, does the science teacher go, oh man, I was in the look back circle. I need to not come to school for a few days. Or I mean, how does that, what does that look like? Or how does that work? You know, so that's more of a, probably a school question, but how dynamic are we gonna be with the information from the state or the county? Whereas, you know, if somebody does have it, that's in the school, are we able to work with that? Yeah, Megan will be able to address those questions a lot better. Okay. So we're talking about um, if somebody were to be positive or they are potential exposure, um, it's a case by case basis. You can go on right now through MDH, um, and they do have guidelines, and there's links on here that we can go through. Um, but if you know that you are associated with a positive case, you would have to be quarantined for a certain amount of days. That's the guidance right now. That could change in two weeks as well. Um, so we'll have to be really good about communicating out what is expected of each one every day. Um, this is Anne with Horizon, and if it's okay, I will. I'll, I'll just, I'll just jump in here. Um, the question was, how many lab tests have been done um, in Pope County, and uh, through? Uh, let's see. 
This would have been through last Thursday. In Polk County, there has been 1,652 tests that were completed um, up through that time. And we have had 48 um, cases and there are six active cases right now. Um, but back to the question on sort of, um, that is exactly the scenario of uh, somebody having contact with someone and then they tested positive and things that is, um, those are exactly the scenarios that our case investigation and contact tracing team are working through on a daily basis. Um, and so that guidance does change periodically. Um, and there are some nuances depending upon the type of work that someone is involved in, um, if they're considered an essential worker or not, um, and some different things. But what I will say is very generally right now, um, people would be asked to quarantine for 10 days. Um, and then there's some other pieces to that. We are anticipating some exclusion guidance. Um, staff at the Minnesota Department of Health has told us that they are making um, some exclusion algorithms um, specific to schools. So we're waiting to get that and see um, and hoping that that is going to, because I think there's going to be a lot of questions and, there, and, um, and it can take a lot to sort through some of those things. And sometimes people don't need to exclude themselves. Sometimes if they've been a contact of a contact and so on, then, um, then it is okay for them to continue um, to continue to be um, um, in that environment too. So, so sometimes, um, yeah, it's, it's, comp it, it's complicated and there's just a lot of nuances to it. So Andy, you know out of those 1,652 cases, how many of those are COVID residents? I'm sorry, but I can't hear um, what that, I think it was a question for me. Yes, out of those 1,652 cases, how many of those were actually Polk County residents? That would be Pope County, um, that would be Pope County residents, 1,652. Um, I can, so what happens with that is, is, is when the test is done, it is pulling data from the person's medical record. So the easy, an easy example that I like to give is if, let's say that, um, let's say that you had a student who um, grew up and went to school in, um, at Minnewaska and they lived in Glenwood, for example. And now they were a college student um, up in Moorhead at Moorhead, um, attending school there, um, but they keep in their medical record, they keep Glenwood as their address because they're moving every six to nine months as college students tend to do. When our case investigators would contact that person and have the and complete the interview, they would find out that that person is not living in Glenwood, they are living in Moorhead, and then the case gets transferred and the data gets transferred to Clay County, for example, um, up in Moorhead. So then it wouldn't show up as a Polk County um, case, if that makes sense. That's kind of how that works. So, um, so initially, when those cases are initially reported um, on the Minnesota Department of Health, you'll see kind of some grayed out area and they call it preliminary data. And some of that is for that very reason. They, are, they work to, um, for lack of a better term, clean the data as the interview is done. So things get, um, if there's something that um, isn't quite right, um, such as that example, then um, those things do get shifted in the system. And so uh, sometimes we had one of our counties who went from zero case to one case, and then they found out it wasn't their case. So then they went back to zero um, on the on the, the Minnesota Department of Health dashboard, and and that raised a lot of questions, but it also lets people know that, you know, that is preliminary data and, and it will get moved if it should be. Are there any other questions? Okay. So I just have one last question. So I'm, I'm confused with the whole, you know, you see tons of data and all this, these different scenarios, but if there's, if, let's say, when you say there's six active cases right now, it's mm -hmm. well, to me looking at, at at that number alone, and in our community, our buyer, who, who made the decision to, that we follow the 14-day deal and versus just active cases, and like kind of what Rick was saying, you know, like if it's maybe a nursing home or just how, how do we get to that? And what like like we're like right now we're not even looking at that in in uh, person in school for the 
What makes that change? I mean, next week, if there's three active cases, I mean, do we all of a sudden say, well, let's, let's yeah. get it rolling here? I think that's what they're saying. That, that, I just yeah. want to be clear. Yeah. Based on that calculation, on that number that you get, which is 11.8, which puts us in what the state is recommending. And what I think what, what Rick was saying was if it was all in a, a nursing home, then we can make a decision to bring kids in, but it's not. What he's saying is kids that are in their 20s. Well, and also, like you said, I believe, Rick, is that getting that information faster. Like you said, we go to that, that key last data available is July 25th, mm -hmm. no, August 10th. Right. We're two weeks behind that. So, when does that dashboard get printed? To make it, you know, how, how soon are we getting that information? Yeah, I don't know what the lag is. But yeah, Jeff, I, that's, that's where right. it's coming from. Responding. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly my concern is uh, a number doesn't flip us up or down in and of itself. We're going to use these numbers and hopefully we'll get wonderful consultation from Ann and her team and especially from the Department of Education since they're setting this up for the whole state. <clears throat> but um, let's say that we're eight to 12 or seven to 15. If we could get a little more data about where the cases are, well, that might be the same thing for us all the way through. And I think that uh, there might be other people that you're gonna wanna put on this team or different people. Oh, this is a proposed plan. But I think that those folks will benefit if they could consider all that. And maybe we'll get in a rhythm of being in one kind of school or another as we move forward. We don't have to, we're not going to be jacking each other around here because we got families out there that got to look at daycare and transportation and all of that stuff. And so um, I'm, I'm hoping that the state will allow us to settle into ranges. And Ann and her team communicate with the state. So that's why I'm trying to get them to you know, be really candid on what is that number? That's just a number, but we should be more concerned. I'm not a medical person, but, but about ranges. And if we could know where that's located, be all the better, because then we would gain the confidence of our community saying, well, here's why we did that made this decision. And every week we have to do this. And I think Nick just talked about the data being dated like we need to know the formula so we can have the most recent information uh, to, to guide us, not to make the decision for us. So, uh, and Ann, we're, we're gonna need you or your representative to help along those ways because if, if we go from one setting to another, my understanding is we have to answer to the Department of Education, the Department of Health. And when we do that, we just want to say, well, here's the data upon which we're recommending this decision. And we care more about the people in this, in our school than anybody does. And so we're taking it seriously, but it's a guide. I mean, it's my understanding it's not a hard, fast thing. And that's why they set it up this way. That's why the governor, one of the founding principles of what the governor has stated is that it's local control. So if you go off the deep end, you got to answer the commissioner, and she has the she has the right to trump whatever it is that you've done. But you can also talk to those folks about for these reasons, even though we're a 14, we'd like to stay in you know in person learning. Um, so, uh, and we we thought that there would be guidance <coughs> out by now since we're starting school in three weeks that we, we could depend on and we could actually bring a team together and start to, you know, having that group work together and think about this stuff instead of meeting once and saying, here's a number and, you know, here's what we're doing. So, and I, I think that Ann and I have had this conversation, so I think we're on the same page with we need the state to recognize that's what we'd be doing. And if that's not the right thing to do, they need to correct us on it. 
to Jeff's point, have you had any directions from the commissioner on what how she feels about these? So let's say we say, okay, we're going to send everybody in person. We don't care what the number is. Did she get her anything or anything hard to pass on that? Yep, there, there's two committees that we would deal with. If if we're going to move into a more restrictive environment setting, in other words, we're moving to from let's say in-person learning to hybrid or from hybrid to stay at home distance learning, then it's my understanding we're going to talk to the commissioner of health and explain why we're doing that. But if we are in hybrid learning and we want to move to everybody being on site. The more the traditional sense, you know, we have to convince the commissioner of why why we're making that move. And if my feeling on that is, I think we should be able to lobby based on what our needs are. I mean, that's local control. Uh, but if we only have one number to go by, uh, we can't make other things up. So that's why I I think that. They promised us more diverse information so that we could make an informed decision. And uh, they haven't produced it yet, not the county, but the state. And so I'm wanting to lean on them to do what they said they were going to do. But, I mean, none of us have been through it before. So. Okay. All right, do we have any other questions, Brandon? And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And I look forward to partnering with you. Thank you. I look forward to working uh, working with you guys uh, as well. And uh, it's certainly um, going to be a challenge, but uh, um, but we'll all work together to try to uh, best serve our communities and our kids and families. So thank you. Thanks, Jan. All right, David. Good evening. Um, with with the whole planning, Sarah Sarah alluded to this too, and I apologize that some of my stuff is going to be. Uh, replicated and duplicated from from what she has has already spoke, and I may kind of cruise through some of that because it's already been brought up. Um, what we heard last year from from student surveys and parent surveys of our of our spring distant learning it was it was kind of a consistent um, theme of structure, um, consistency with the students and learning. And then the learning management systems, the, the difference of learning management systems. So what we have done in the in the 9-12 planning, and I know um, kind of pairing with Sarah in her 7-9, 7-8 pairing as well, is we've really tried to um, solve those issues of consistency structure and the learning management system. So we have uh, all the way through 4-12, we've decided that we're going to house our classrooms online through Google Classroom. Um, and that's going to be our our platform for this this school year and and moving forward. Um, I can't promise you that that won't change down the road, but at this point in time, through through COVID and uh, and our three models, that's that's the way we're going with 412. Um, I can't speak of what Scott's doing in E3. I believe he's he's with a different management system, but they have what they're you know what they have going is 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 working very well. So that's one thing that we've worked on. And then throughout our planning with in-person, uh, hybrid and distant learning, we really tried to, to keep con uh, structure and consistency, regardless of you know those numbers fluctuate and we move from hybrid to distant learning. We want that, we want that consistency. Or if we go from you know hybrid to in-person, we want that consistency. So parents understand what we're asking, the students understand and they're not coming and going and, and, and their minds are all, all confused. So we've, we've really tried to, um, to hone in on those uh, during our, our decision making. As Scott had said too, we, with our BLT, uh, we have met, today was our, uh, I think it was our fifth meeting. Uh, we've had great conversation, um, kind of touching upon the AB days and things like that. We've gone, We've had everything on the on the chalkboard, and we've we've gone back and forth and forth and back and back and forth again, and and uh, we've we've really ironed out a lot of things, and and it really came down to consistency of we have shared staff from all the way from fourth grade uh, through senior high, 
<clears throat> and what what works best for for all those students and all those staff. Um, what we're looking at in the high school, we're going to have the ability to be live. Uh, we're going to have the ability to actually live stream our classroom with document cameras, speakers. Um, staff will have their computers, so they'll they'll continue to meet with uh, off-campus students um, distantly, whether it's Google Meets, whether it's uh, other live stream avenues. So we will have that ability regardless of if a student is is in-person hybrid or um, or distantly. And as we've now been looking at our numbers, um, and you have a better understanding of where we are at today, and if we were to start school today, um, K6 would be would be in person, and 712 would be um, hybrid. So as we kind of go through, we're, we in the high school, we've kind of understood that we're going to be kind of floating around that hybrid. Um, for quite some time. So we've spent a lot of time on what that hybrid model looks like. And it's very consistent with what Sarah has already spoke about um, in the middle school. So I'll briefly touch upon what in-person looks like in the high school. And those are based upon those MDE numbers, those numbers in the county. Um, in-person is gonna look very similar to what our traditional schedule looks like. Seven period day um, and the kids will, you know, they'll be moving around. We will have some some changes and modifications to to scheduling and passing times and things like that based on with safe, safety and security of the students so um, you know we're still going to have our temperature checks in the morning uh, once kids come in the building regardless if we're hybrid regardless if we're in person they'll come in they'll take their their temperature with the kiosk machines they'll go to their locker they'll get their stuff for the day and then they will go to their first period class instead of um, traditionally hanging out for however long socializing we're going to restrict that a little bit so we will have restricted movements in the mornings and evenings lunch times and in passing but otherwise in person will look very similar to what we are accustomed to our hybrid plan um, is is very similar to uh, the the middle school so we're looking at an a b schedule um, where if you are A students, you're showing up in person in the building Mondays and Thursdays. If you are a B in, in the B group, you will be in person on campus Tuesdays and Fridays, with Wednesday being that deep clean, um, but also Wednesday is going to be distant learning for AB, all AB students. Um, they're going to continue to work on their learning, their activities, uh, homework, and we're really focusing on that day for interventions, um, tutoring, any uh, students that are potentially slipping academically, we're gonna be able to reach out and, and touch, touch those kids um, on those Wednesdays. We're also looking at Wednesday being a live interaction for, for all distant learning students. We're looking at about 10% of our high school that are going, uh, that are going, that have selected distant learning. We have four freshmen and anywhere from 10, 11 or 12 um, in the in the 10th through 12th grade. So we know that we currently have about 10% of our high school kids that'll be distant learning. What we're asking our, our high school staff is we're gonna be reaching out live interaction, a minimum of three for those distant learning students. So on Wednesday, that'll give the, those, those teachers the opportunity um, to reach out to those kids as well. Um, <clears throat> one thing that, that Sarah touched upon is, is you know, it, it is new. Um, it is, it's going to be new to have kids on campus two days of in-person instruction and distant learning three days. Um, and it's going to be really, those teachers are going to be really focusing on their pacing guides that they've already created and their established learning outcomes as they plan their week lessons. So they're going to be kind of planning, and working for the ultimate goal for the week and kind of working backwards. Really, really working with those in-person days to um, to really ramp up the education and then during those during those distant learning days to supplement those materials, um, it it obviously you walk in a high school teacher's classroom, my classroom may be presented and look differently than yours, and it's going to look differently in the hybrid model uh, as well. <clears throat> um, Essentially, teachers are going to be teaching the same content that they have regarding those those uh, pacing guides. It's just going to be 
two days a week for in-person and three days distant learning. Um, then we move into our distant learning plan. What we, as I talked about, is consistency. We are going to we are going to maintain if we do get to that number um, for distant learning students. We're going to maintain that same A B schedule. Um, so kids are going to still get their seven periods a day on that A B schedule. So they'll be required to be uh, part of the A day or how, however whichever they fit in. They'll be required to. Uh, be very structured two days a week and then the more flexible distant learning uh, three days a week um, and as Sarah did touch upon we are offering distant learning to any students that want to that want to uh, take us up on that offer throughout the whole entire year or if our numbers get to a certain extent uh, as according to those charts um, then we will be uh, forced to go into the distant learning plan as far as as far as entering and exiting our our school building, nine through twelfth grade students are going to be coming in the, the door two, so main uh, door to the high school building, and there will be the the kiosk machine. Actually, I think we're having two in the in the front, uh, two kiosk machines. Um, once they come in, they're going to grab their materials. They're going to go to their classroom. Exiting the building is going to be very similar to. Uh, 11 through 12th grade students are going to be released at 307 so we're going to shave a little bit of time off so we so we limit uh, students moving about and then 9 through 12 9 through 10th grade students will be leaving at 310 as far as cafeteria Sarah did touch upon this what we're looking at for cafeteria and lunches for the high school is, is currently they have a 30 minute lunch time we're going to shave that down where they're going to have 20 minutes of actual eating time whether that's in the cafeteria or in an alternative location and then um, to get other groups in there we'll have 10 minutes of supervised time in in another location to uh, to get other folks coming in and, and uh, eating lunch if we're in person we're looking at two-thirds capacity in the in the lunchroom if we are hybrid which which uh, we're looking at at uh, starting in a hybrid we'll be at 50 percent capacity in that in that lunchroom as far as uh, schedules and bells go, um, one thing that's new about passing time this year is we, we are going to allow backpacks for our 9th through 12th grade students. And we're not only going to allow it, we're going to highly encourage it for kids to come in in the day, go to the lockers in the morning, grab their materials, grab their books, put them in their backpack, and they should not have to return to their locker until the end of the, end of the school day to reduce passing um, kind of social gathering during passing time. As far as classroom spacing goes, uh, in person, the recommendations for social distancing, we will, we will continue to work with that as much as possible, but we also understand that if we are in person, we will have, we will have our traditional class sizes. Uh, we will do the best we can as far as social distancing. Once we're hybrid, then we are required to um, work that number down to 50%. Our, our capacity, room capacities for the majority of our rooms are, uh, will allow us to get to that 50% without uh, finding other locations. <clears throat> and uh, let's see here. Finally, with absenteeism, very similar to what uh, Sarah talked about in seventh and eighth grade. If a student has extended period of time the way they're out, ill, they're in the hospital uh, due to COVID, we do have that distant learning option available for them. Otherwise, if it's just a normal, they have the flu for a day, they, you know, your regular routine illnesses throughout the year, we will, we will uh, continue with our um, traditional absentee policies with that. Questions? I got everybody's questions hammered out earlier. <laughs> Thank you. I would just say, Board, if you get the chance to look at the detailed model, you look at the hybrid learning model, it explains it pretty fully there. So uh, 
families are going to be able to look at this and I think have some pretty good information about what they should plan for. Okay, well, I don't need to take too much of your time. Um, very similar to what the other buildings are doing. We've talked about our staggered release screenings of our kids. Um, the one variable that we have is just dealing with so many different counties and bringing in their students. I mean, I did speak with Ann on the phone today. She agreed with our idea of going with um, the, just, or the county of residence for the students will determine the plan that they're on. Um, that seems to make the most sense. Masks, I think, are going to be an issue in our building. Um, but like Megan said, we'll work through that um, and the behaviors that may come with that. Our building has a lot of real estate per, per student, so keeping space isn't going to be a huge issue. But I do see, um, kind of depending on where behaviors come and how, I mean, sometimes we're a full contact setting. So that will be a variable that we'll just have to kind of see how that plays out. Um, and our mental health services, we're going to be able to build our schedule that can kind of travel between each model pretty seamlessly, I think, um, with all of our services um, being able to be telemedicine if we need, including the group skills, which is something we didn't get to do in the spring. So as far as billing and services goes, we're going to be in pretty good shape. Um, there is a kind of a fuller document um, if you need to click on that. Otherwise, it's, it's pretty standard, and I, I think we're feeling pretty confident. Any questions for me? Um, so uh, the way it looks, we're going to start with, and we're prioritizing K-6 in our building most days up until we get to that Tier 4. Um, but then when we get to high school students, we will do the A, B, we'll do Monday, Tuesday. Same, same, as, same as what everybody's doing. But we're doing, and we're doing that split by county or by district. So we'll have a few districts coming on Monday and Tuesday. The others will come on Thursday and Friday, and Wednesday would be our distance day. Megan? As Megan's coming up, if, if we look at this uh, board, this is what uh, Chairman Christensen and I talked about in terms of a proposed uh, leadership team to deal with this issue every day. And uh, I think that uh, we would need you to appoint a couple of members, Chad, that uh, if they've shown interest, I know that uh, Ted has, and I think Diane has. <laughs> okay, good. And then uh, there are other people in the community that we might want to have engaged. And I know you have some thoughts on that, but uh, I would like to know by the end of tonight, I'd like to make sure we can take this up at some point tonight where uh, you give me some guidance on who should be on this because I should really be reaching out to these people now. So, so is this plan prescriptive and selected to those people there or? It would be, uh, no, I just made this up. I'm trying to anticipate what the Department of Health is going to come out saying that we need to do to have a well-rounded team so that if we had to lobby the commissioner or the Department of Health one way or the other, it's just not a board member, just not a superintendent or a principal. It's it's a well-rounded team. We're going to be the only one that is kind of missing and we don't need to somebody from Well, that was, I had two suggestions. One was from the other one would be from emergency management direction. Yeah. So, if that's acceptable to the whole board, I would reach out to those people tomorrow and ask today all these groups if they're willing to set up a committee and we'll get that form so we can start to get a schedule. And you have somebody in mind? Yeah, yeah, because we definitely. Good thoughts on the community and what's going on, what we're testing, what we're seeing before it's reflected a day or, or a week or two later. Right. Okay.
All right, before I jump right into the slides, I just want to say that all of the interventions that we're implementing and the planning that's going on, um, the overarching goal is to limit the potential exposure for every student and staff that come into the building. Um, we are partnering with MDH and MDE to assist us in the recommendations of providing the safe environment for the students. Um, and that's where these links, they come from, right from MDH. And as they get updated and as I get them, we'll pass them out to our ad administration and our staff and the families and students as well. Um, so these resources are a lot of the frequently asked questions that we've been getting. Um, what do we do if you have COVID? Um, what if I do? What do I do if I'm awaiting a test? And then what if I do if I have a close contact? And what is a close contact? All those things are listed in there. Um, they have things of like what symptoms to monitor for, how long to stay home, and um, what your household members should do, including your siblings or your aunt that lives in the basement or something like that. Um, in the next slide, um, Angie, if you could click on that link. That first, that first one. So as we're talking about symptoms to look at and how long to stay home for, this is what the schools need to look look at for their staff and the students today. Um, on the left, those are all the symptoms. And if you have symptoms and you're positive, this is what you need to do. If you have symptoms and you have a negative test, this is what you need to do. If you have symptoms and you decide, I don't want to get tested, but you still have stay home certain amount of days. So this is universal across all of our students all of our students and staff to follow. Um, this could be updated several times throughout the year. Again, we'll just make sure that we communicate that across the board. Thank you, Angie, you can go back. Um, so uh, like you mentioned before, when we do have a positive case, um, we're gonna be following closely with our local public health as well as the Department of Health or state level, and we're gonna identify the contacts and notifying them of the exposure and then provide them instructions with how long they need to stay home for, what they can do to prevent the spread. Um, and then depending on the extent of the exposure and what mitigation measures we have in place at the time, that'll really have an input on the recommendations MDH gives us on what we need to do. If it's doing nothing, if it's um, having the, the one classroom stay home, or if it's the whole school, it really will depend on the situation that we're in. Um, the next slide. Um, masks, um, a lot of questions about this, and we have created a document that we can share out um, as a lot of frequently asked questions about this, um, and we are working on a policy as well. Um, everyone who can wear a mask should wear a mask. Um, even if you've had COVID, you should still wear a mask because we don't know if you can get sick again or if you can um, transfer it to somebody else. Um, we're not going to put any mask on anyone who's under the age of two. Um, there is a tricky the state has a thing of saying two to five year olds not to wear a mask, but if you are if you are in kindergarten and you are five, you still need to wear one. Um, again, we'll work with you um, with face masks, face shields, breaks, anything like that to get used to wearing masks. Um, we don't want to have masks create a hazard or a problem, so not to put anyone on if anyone's having trouble breathing or they're unconscious. Um, and then people with disabilities, if they have medical conditions, behavioral conditions, special health needs, not, if they're not able to wear a mask, there are face shields available um, for them. Any questions? All right. Yep. Corey. Okay. Uh, you heard about, a lot about the te uh, temperature kiosks. Uh, if you go to, go to the next slide, um, it'll show you an example of the uh, kiosk that'll be out there. We have four of them that are coming with the tall stands, two of them with short ones that'll sit on countertops, uh, making it a little bit more adjustable, uh, depending on where we're going to put them. Uh, if you could go back, please, Angie. Um, uh, they will be placed in uh, two in the main entrance here in the building. We will be looking at either two in door four to, or one in door three and door four uh, to, to separate the age groups uh, apart from each other coming into the building. Uh, we have ordered masks, uh, face shields. Uh, we, we still have to order uh, some adult size face uh, masks, but uh, um, trying to get the right ones so they fit right. 
otherwise, most everything's uh, been ordered. Um, the plexiglass, the dividers, uh, those have been uh, installed in certain areas. We're trying to put them up as we go through our regular summer cleaning processes. So those will be, are going up uh, right now. Uh, we will have signage along the drive up. Uh, I want to make sure it's clear. Uh, the drive it, the drive up to drop off kids gets busy. <laughs> it, it it it's it, and I I think with the uh, what's going on, we're going to see a lot more uh, cars driving up there trying to drop off. So we need to direct everybody uh, for sure uh, with clear signage where to drop everybody off at the appropriate door, what doors are going to be available, um, so that everybody can move through the line in an orderly fashion. Um, we're going to have uh, signage throughout the building uh, as far as the six-foot distances on the floors, the markers that you've seen around um, throughout different areas of the building. Um, now, I'll, uh, five and seven kind of go together a little bit. The, uh, um, I'm going into the teacher cleaning part that uh, is so critical. Um, like Rick says, the uh, all hands on deck. I mean, everybody really needs to understand how critical this part is. Um, we it is a major undertaking to try to deep clean through these buildings. We have uh, 220,000 square feet in this building alone. Uh, it's not a small facility, and uh, the the staff that we have will be taxed trying to do that. Um, the uh, the more we can get teachers on board to uh, uh, do some of that cleaning, the better. Um, but I I am working with Rick. I do I do think we need to look at uh, possibility of hiring a couple part-time cleaners um, to go through this uh, time to make sure we are getting everything clean thoroughly um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, the, uh, the regular cleaning and deep cleaning, I already kind of went through that, but um, it's that's basically what we're looking at is the, uh, the washing with soap and water first, uh, all surfaces. Um, the disinfecting will be on uh, door, regular, regularly touched items, door handles, light switches, all that kind of stuff. Things that the teachers can do, like the example in five. Um, simple things as propping the door open. Kids don't have to grab the door and open the door every time. Every person grabbing that same door handle. Prop the thing open, let them come in, and you only have one person hand, handling that door. Uh, different ideas like that that I think we need to... Uh, we can implement and make things a little bit better, but we're still going to be going and disinfecting those as well. Um, cleaning supplies is a, uh, a big topic right now. I'm trying to get uh, some disinfecting wipes, uh, which are commonly used throughout all of our buildings. Um, they're very convenient. They, uh, I threw that in there because every product needs to have the SDS sheet in our books. Um, when we ask everybody to supply all of these different wipes, we have to have SDS sheets on every single one, that, different one that comes in our facilities. What is an SDS sheet? SDS sheet is the, uh, basically the, uh, yeah, safety data sheet. It tells you all everything about that uh, chemical, how, what, how to do uh, first aid for it, uh, everything that's uh, made up from, and how to be safe with it. Um, so it is, it is a major, I mean, if we had 40 different ones come in our building, that's, that's quite an undertaking to try to update all of our books for all of those uh, products. So I'm, I'm proposing that we all get on the same page and we supply one type of disinfecting wipe for all of our buildings. Um, the, uh, to keep everybody on the same page, everybody knows from building to building what we're using. And uh, I think that's a that's a very good uh, good thing to get under on on the same page with. Um, I jumped on eight uh, the HVAC. We've been going through the air handling units. Uh, CDC uh, recommended uh, you know maximizing air air exchanges uh, in and out of the building uh, to to tr help exchange all of this air throughout our air filters in our HVAC units are. We're ahead of what the CDC recommends. We have a two-stage filtration, uh, which is above the MERV 13 that CDC recommends. So we are sitting good with the filtration system. Um, 
just making sure that uh, everything's operating correctly in the air exchanges. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at here, making sure everything's up to par, operating correctly. Um, the uh, cafeteria we've been I've been working with them, uh, Janine and Paulette about uh, switching over through the ca cafeteria because we have our our uh, guy in there uh, taking care of that as well. You'll hear more from them, but uh, that is trying. We're trying to get people through in a in a timely fashion. One issue we're running into is um, every cleaning chemical disinfectant has a dwell time, a kill time. Um, ours uh, was just recently uh, dropped to a three minute dwell time, which is gonna save us a lot of time. But it's not food safe, it's not something we wanna be using in the cafeteria setting. So uh, we do have to go by theirs and they can share that with you. Um, but uh, in the classrooms, we can go by the three minute minute dwell time now, which is gonna save us some time. Um, that's kind of all I have, what do you, any questions? Any questions? Just on, as far as right now looking at your ability to get the disinfecting and stuff, mm -hmm. what is that future look? For? How many days would you have on hand if you to have on hand? Um, well, oh, good question. Um, I mean, basically, I'm going to plan for the worst case scenario. I mean, at the fastest rate we're going to go through it is what I'm going to stock. Uh, I'm going to try to keep uh, uh, at least, uh, I, they only deliver every month. I'm going to probably try to keep at least a month on hand at any given time um, okay. at yeah. our fastest rate. Yeah. That's what we found, as every industry has, is if you can get it, you can buy what you're able to at that time to store right. because. Like some of our lab supplies and stuff from our vendors, we haven't gotten, they've been out of order since April. So we have to rely sure. on the other resources that yep. come in. Yep. And that's, uh, we put in all these pallet racking uh, in the back uh, loading dock area, and that's uh, that's a very beneficial thing right now because they are going to be full. <laughs> we're going to stock up on all that stuff, and we're all the uh, sanitizer, all of that kind of stuff will be stocked up back there. Thank you. So. Any other questions? Hello, everybody. Sorry, when you wear these masks, you get caught on your earrings. <laughs> Guess the only women in the group know how that feels. All right, um, I'm going to have to use my notes to guide us a little bit. Uh, we do food service for two districts, and our heads are starting to spin a little bit. A lot of different scenarios are out there. Um, the goal with developing our plan was really to make sure that students still got a good choice, and we retained high quality in our meals but we did have to decrease the amount of choices that we give to students. Um, they gotta get through the line fast, basically. Like you heard Nate say, they have 20 minutes to eat now. Um, they'll still get choice, but we have to make some accommodations for that. Another goal was really to maximize the amount of meals that we can get to our students, especially when we're in hybrid and long distance learning situations. So that's for the sake of our students and the sake of our staff as well. Um, so I'm gonna give you an overview of each school. I know some of the principals already did that, so I'll try and keep it brief and then just see if you have questions. Um, our food supply, supply chain is also experiencing issues. We plan on seeing outs. We plan on seeing very elevated food prices this year, as you probably noticed when you go to the grocery store. <laughs> We're gonna see the same thing um, in food service as well. So uh, let me quickly go over just some of our student safety measures that we are putting into place in nutrition services. Um, we are introducing barcode scanners this year instead of pin pads. Usually kids put in their lunch number. It's always a struggle for them to remember 
And it's always been a struggle during cold and flu season anyways, um, every year. So we thought, well, the time is now with COVID just to make a permanent change. So we didn't feel this change was just because of COVID, uh, but it definitely will help. Every student will receive a barcode card. They do have to hang on to it. They'll have a lanyard and there probably be, will be a small fee um, for issuing them a new card if they do lose it. So we highly encourage them to hold on to it, but they'll use that card as they go through the lunch line and we'll have scanners. So that whole process is now contactless, which we're pretty happy about. Um, another thing is uh, peanuts, and this probably applies more to the elementaries, and we have a little work to do yet on this, but usually to help those students um, with their peanut allergies and avoid any cross contact. We have peanut tables in the cafeteria. Well, now since students are eating in their room, that makes things a little different, a little tighter. Um, so we'll have to designate a peanut free area in each classroom and really encourage parents if they're bringing food home or they're or sending food from home with their student that it is also peanut free if they have a peanut allergy in that classroom. So we'll have to have a good communication plan there as well um, between the the teacher and parents. Uh, another thing that will be noticeable to students is no more self-serve bars. Uh, they used to have quite a few choices and were able to serve themselves, but obviously we don't want them touching utensils, etc., and having any cross contact there. As far as our staff safety, we are wearing face masks 100% of the time. Um, we are giving our staff the option of face shields because COVID can also be transmitted through the eyes. We want to make sure our staff is safe. Our staff is coming into contact with every single student where teachers just have their classes. So we feel the need for that extra safety precaution is even greater. We'll maintain six foot distancing in our kitchens as much as possible. And we are moving to compostable trays versus anything that we would send through the dishwasher. And again, that's mostly for our staff safety. So we avoid just that whole droplet contamination. All right. So I'll quickly go over the scenarios. Like I said, um, the in-person learning model at uh, the elementary school grades K through three, we will be doing a breakfast kiosk at the entrance of where, where the kids come in so they can quickly grab their breakfast that's already gonna be prepackaged for them, take it to their classroom. Oh, there's no slides, wonderful. Okay, uh, where they can take it to their classroom and just eat it there. And then for lunch, our staff will deliver meals to each classroom. And then garbages will be in the hallway for the kids to dispose of their food. Um, for the in-person model for four through six, Sarah went over that pretty well. Again, it's a grab-and-go situation. Um, lunch is going to be served at various locations throughout the building to keep kids distance. Again, it's not going to be that six-foot distancing, but we're going to get as close to it as possible. Um, same with seven through 12. And then uh, Winnie Academy has it much better because they have a little bit more space in their cafeteria. And uh, I know that we're going to be meeting with Sarah, or Kelly rather, and going through a seating arrangement. But um, it's much more accomplishable. We also plan on floor signage at some point here too to keep kids distance as they come through the lunch line. Under hybrid, um, do you want me to go ahead and talk about that part? Okay. Uh, of course, we're going to be adhering to the six foot distancing. So really K through six, it's the same as in person, but with greater distancing adhering to that six feet. And of course, as Corey mentioned, for seven through 12, it's the AB model. So this adds some complexity because kids aren't in school every day. So how are we going to get them meals? We will have a meal pickup available for them on Wednesdays. So Wednesday, our staff is going to be preparing food and then have a meal pickup um, location yet to be determined. It's going to be at one of our sites. And hopefully from the 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock hour, so making it a little later so it's more convenient for parents to pick up meals. They'll be picking up basically three days worth of meals, breakfast and lunch. Uh, we will have to have them pre-sign up for it because the big thing that has changed in our world is meals are no longer paid for, which we had in the spring, which made it really nice. But now we have a whole accountability piece 
where we have to know if the student is free, reduced, or full paid, and they will be charged for their lunch if they sign up for meals. Okay, and then for full distance learning, um, we're going to all meal delivery via a meal sign up. And we're not sure if that is an everyday delivery or if that is a once a week delivery. We're pretty flexible on that and we'll have to work with the transportation department when we get there. Any questions on food service? Questions? No? Nope. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill? All right, uh, several things here, obviously activities, community education activities primarily has been really in the spotlight over the last couple of weeks, to be sure. Uh, I've spoken to a number of you and, and almost everybody I know in this county that is concerned with activities uh, over the last 30 to 45 days uh, about what was going to happen, what's the league going to decide, what are we going to do with uh, what's going to happen in the fall. So uh, that was finally all decided last week. It, it did not come easy for the Minnesota State High School League, but uh, you know a lot of things went on in regards to activities, which I'll just note. Uh, Really quickly here as, as we go through. First of all, all the guidance uh, that we followed since the latter stages of June when uh, activities were allowed to continue according to the league and, and the policies that they created for, for summer activities with our coaches, uh, as well as community education activities through the, through the state of Minnesota and the Department of Health. Uh, we've been involved in that since then, uh, since that time period. And we're gonna continue that as we go along. That's not gonna change. And we've talked about all those things already. Uh, and so I, I don't want to go into that, uh, you know, piece by piece because everybody's already seen a lot of that. But uh, so the preparedness plans, our health screenings, those things will all all stay the same as they have all all summer. I will say that, that this summer I think things have gone very very well. We we're one of the first groups that had to get involved with this, other than uh, the uh, 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 essential care that was provided during distant learning last March through through the end of May. So we were. Uh, you know, got a got a little bit of a, a head start on this versus everybody else, but uh, it's gone well. We've had a few uh, anxious moments with participants who weren't uh, feeling well from time to time. We've had had uh, a handful of tests. By handful, I mean probably less than five, but those were all negative. We did have uh, one participant that uh, uh, was was positive, but he did not uh, acquire the virus here at school. He uh, and he didn't have it. He didn't have any symptoms while he was here, uh, and that ended up. Uh, working out just fine. Uh, he stayed at home for his 14 days, and, and he has since come back, and and uh, everything is good that way. But so we haven't had a, an actual uh, infected participant here in our community education programs or activity programs this summer. So that's obviously really positive. Um, several things. Uh, as far as uh, can you where it says MSH MSHSL approved fall seasons? Uh, can you click on that, Angie? Thank you. Uh, this is what came out last Friday. Okay, these are the approved fall sports from the Minnesota State High School League. Obviously, that was really big news last Thursday. Uh, we, girls tennis uh, in our school, boys soccer, boys and girls cross country, girls swimming and diving will all take place this fall. The start dates are all next Monday. The seasons themselves are 80% of the normal length. The competitions are 70% of the normal length. So you can see that. Uh, say, for example, girls tennis is uh, the first, uh, it starts the 17th. The end date for the entire season is October 17th. Uh, total weeks, including the postseason nine, you get a maximum 11 contest. Usually it's 16. So uh, that's how they've cut that down. Um, you can only uh, compete twice a week, and you can only have in swimming and, in, uh, excuse me, in uh, girls and boys cross country and girls tennis, you can only compete against no more than two teams in any one event. So there can be three total teams for cross country and girls tennis. The other uh, events, soccer, and, and and you wouldn't have that soccer anyway, but girls swimming, you can go to uh, big meets and things like that. Uh, those aren't allowed. You have to swim against just one just one school only. So it's a one 
uh, meet competition. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, scrimmaging. There are no tournaments. There is no uh, captain's practice this week. We had an issue this morning. I had to take care of one of our coaches. Didn't get the message on that, but, but uh, that's been taken care of now. Uh, so it's changed dramatically. Uh, as far as a lot of people have questions already about the postseason, uh, whether it's in the fall or the winter or the spring, uh, the league is taking everything like a lot of us kind of day by day, and they're not quite sure yet. They're going to see how everything goes. I'm hoping for some kind of postseason competition, but it may be at the end of the day there's nothing. It might be, a, or maybe a, they're talking about maybe a sectional tournament only or a conference tournament, things like that. But if they can do something at the section and state level, I know they're going to do that. So, uh, again, I think the league has done a, a good job putting this together. They've taken a lot of heat. There's a lot of, there was a lot of positives last Thursday. There's a lot of negatives. Uh, but for the most part, I think they, they did about as good a job as they possibly could. And as most people know, football and, uh, and volleyball has been moved to the, the spring of the year. Uh, and as far as the fall sports season, even though this is ending shorter, everything will be done by October 31st. Everything's done in the fall. Uh, the plan right now from the league perspective is not to start any of the winter activities until the normal regular time, which would be about the second week for girls basketball, the third week for, for, for wrestling and for uh, and for boys basketball and then dance would probably start in late October. I've I heard anything different about that. So uh, I'm assuming that will all be the same. But again, the league is, is giving bringing out information to all the schools on a, on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. So lots of things that they have have going on. So that is uh, what's going on here for the fall. The other thing that's worth noting, and uh, if you go back, Angie, to that slide, uh, we are going to have a meeting with all of our head coaches, directors and advisors on Wednesday to talk about all this because there's a lot of stuff going on here uh, that needs to be discussed because on top of the four activities that the league has approved, and I'm not, I have a pretty good idea why they did this, and it has nothing to do with outstate schools, but there are 11 other sports, volleyball, football included, as well as every one of our spring sports, which are seven, eight counting trap shooting. Those are 14 possible sports practices that can take place this fall. That's a little problematic for a school our size and for, for uh, participants that we have that are involved in multiple sports. Uh, my own opinion is that, that, well, it's not really that important, but I think there were a lot of people that were decision makers on the board of directors that were from big schools and cities that only have one sport athletes across the board. Uh, we have, we don't have that here. And so we need to discuss that as a group of coaches to make sure we're all on the same page. I think we all pretty much are, but we need to talk about that and see where that, uh, where that discussion goes on Wednesday. And I, I'm very confident, just like we did in the, in the, in June to figure out what we had to do to be effective uh, this summer. I think we can uh, clear any, any issues up and, and uh, uh, have a positive experience going forward this fall for our participants. But I know we can't be, we can't have kids involved in 14, 14 activities. Can you go back one more? Uh, we're going we're gonna to have to move it along because I'm already. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. We're good. Uh, we just have that going on. Uh, children, uh, as far as uh, care of children, families, these are all things that are similar to what you've seen already tonight. Uh, you can hit the, the, a school age child care. Why don't you just hit, click that? We'll go through that really, really quickly. There's a number of slides here, but uh, we'll go through them really quick. We're going to have critical care uh, workers' provisions in, pl in place. Or not? Yeah, you got to go back. For some reason, you have to go back to one. I don't know why it went to seven. Okay, in person learning, just the same as uh, everything else. Uh, child care during school uh, hours for critical care workers would not be offered if we're all, all our students are attending school. Go on, hybrid learning model, uh, same thing uh, as we had last spring as well with distance learning, it'd be the same for hybrid learning. Everybody three through 12 required by MDE, we have to provide the child care for essential workers. So uh, no issues there, same thing, go ahead. Distance learning would be exactly the same. Uh, there are some, uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we're going to try to expand our after school enrichment program this year. We're going to have a before school program as well as an after school program in both in both schools, in the, in the middle school here, at the elementary school, uh, obviously downtown. So that should wor work well. Uh, we believe we have enough uh, interest in, in getting that started. Continue on. Uh, there will be a cost involved. It will be $5 per day per day for the before school uh, enrichment program, $8 a day. For the after-school enrichment program, uh, we figured in, factored in what the work, what the employees would cost, and how many we would need, and how many we'd need to break even. And we, we think we're in a place where, where that would work. So uh, we're going to see again how that all uh, 
works out as we move through the beginning part of the school year. Go ahead. There are some challenges. You know, will, will there be enough staffing? We believe there will be space. That's to be determined. That's not an issue at the at the uh, middle school. We're working that out as well as at the elementary school, working with Scott and Sarah there. Uh, cleaning and sanitation following the early morning program that would be a concern, but I think we'll be able to stay on top of that with Corey and and uh, and our staff here at school. Uh, the after school enrichment program uh, again, that's the same type of thing. The after school program would be eight dollars a day as opposed to the five in the morning because there's a lot more kids in that program. That's a lot bigger program. It runs a longer time period. So I think is that it? Pretty much. A few challenges there as well. I think that's it. Thanks, Bill. You got. It. Andrew, do you want to advance? Thank you. Can you click on the survey first? Good evening. So I'm going to start by um, going over survey results for our early childhood um, Little Lakers preschool program. We implemented a survey for our preschool families as well, but um, altered it just a little bit based on kind of the information and data that we wanted to get from that. Um, the number one question that I you know, was looking to gain from the um, phone surveys was what our enrollment was going to look like for fall. So. Preschool registration begins in February, and so the vast majority of families that are currently enrolled had enrolled before COVID um, had become a part of our reality. So um, I was pleased to see, um, and I, I wanted to point out too that this we used the same survey um, for both um, our three-year-old families and four or five-year-old families. So the data represents all families, um, all students in our Little Acres preschool program. So the vast majority of students are, or families are still planning to send their child um, in person in the fall. What I have seen over the last um, couple of months, those that are um, having second thoughts, have concerns, um, have deciding to, to remove their child from the program are primarily coming out of our three-year-old class. Um, those families that have, are having some concerns are feeling that, well, you know, I can pull my child this year, they'll still have a year of preschool the following year. So we're seeing our numbers in the three-year-old class decrease a little bit over the last month or so. Um, in the fours and fives, um, it's stayed about consistent over the summer months. Um, similar to the K-12 survey, we asked families to kind of tell us how, how they are feeling about resetting their child um, to an in-person setting. And as you can see from the, the percentages that the majority of families are, are feeling more so in that, that comfortable range. Um, before we I touch on transportation, there were a couple other questions I didn't include we include the survey results, but um, we asked a few questions just about scheduling pieces, just some of those moving parts that we're having to look at to plan for the various scenarios in our school year. Um, but transportation was a big piece that I wanted to touch on. Um, anticipating that the transportation needs, which namely is, is Rainbow Rider, families have the option um, or their options for transportation in preschool are either in-person drop off and pick up or Rainbow Rider. Um, in years past, we've had a good number of families that have utilized Rainbow Rider. So in kind of anticipating the same, um, that was a, a piece that I wanted to, to find out from families, find out about from families. And as you can see, about a third of all of our students enrolled in preschool um, do utilize Rainbow Rider to some capacity, whether it's both ways every single day or just um, one, one route um, over the course of a week. So we do have a third of our population that is using Rainbow Rider. And the reason for um, getting into this piece was because we know that trans um, Rainbow Rider being a public transportation um, service does have to abide by social distancing and reduce their capacities. And so, um, you know, trying to accommodate all of our families' needs and making sure that they're able to still um, have a way of sending their child to school. I wanted to, you know, get some data in terms of what their plans were for transportation, but then also on the next slide, um, find out if they have a plan if they have a plan B, if they have another option that would enable them to adjust a lunch break or to ride share with other families from the same daycare. So as you can see, 
um, about half of those that are needing Rainbow Rider do have um, another option that they could utilize, but there are a small percentage that, that would not. So I'm currently working with Rainbow Rider um, to see what sort of scenarios we can um, explore. We've talked about kind of having um, drop off and pick up in waves so that they could do multiple routes within each school day to accommodate um, the transportation needs that exist. And then our last question on the survey um, asked about distance learning. As you know, we offered distance, we partook, partook in distance learning last spring along with um, K-12 students. We did not charge a fee for this. And um, as beneficial as it was to be able to continue those, um, maintaining those relationships and that learning, it did eat up our, um, our school readiness budget. So. Um, with that, I wanted to get some information from families in terms of what their interest level would be in doing distance learning this year if we were directed to do so um, with a fee, a reduced fee perhaps associated with that. Um, and again, I wanted to break down this data. Roughly two thirds of our four and five year old, four and five year old families express interest that they were willing to do so or would be willing to consider it. And only about, um, a third of our three-year-old families. So again, um, good information to have as we um, continue planning for the, all three models this year. So next I'll kind of touch on what our programming plans will look like for both preschool and ECFE. Um, and again, we're planning for all three scenarios. Um, in I'll start with preschool. Both are, as of now, along with K3, we are planning to start our year in person. Um, we're fortunate that both our in-person and hybrid models are going to look um, quite similar. Um, in both of those models, students are coming to school in person on their um, regularly scheduled days. Um, we are going to be making some small adjustments to scheduling this year, and that was due to um, the, the knowledge of um, anticipating what would happen if we go into a hybrid model, we would be reducing the number of classrooms available to us. Um, we'd be going from four classrooms to three. Um, so in anticipating that, we needed to make sure that we had time for cleaning to take place in those shared spaces um, to make sure that we could kind of find a way to eliminate um, groups of families, groups of um, students entering and exiting the building at the same time. So we'll be looking at our morning class ending a half an hour earlier and our afternoon classes beginning a half hour later. So that'll create, rather than them starting and ending at the same time, that'll create an hour um, for those exit and entry points, not clogging those up, also to do some thorough cleaning um, in those shared spaces. Uh, I mentioned that both hybrid and in-person would look similar. Um, at a preschool level, with our existing class sizes, we are at 50% capacity as it is. So if we do have to go into a hybrid model, um, it would not have a significant impact on our littlest learners. They would um, still, with their entire class, their familiar faces, same staff, the most noticeable change would be a, just a different room. Um, Scott has talked a little bit about um, Exit and entry points will be utilizing the southwest doors, and we believe with our the starting ending points that we have established that it will help um, help in the flow of students entering and exiting the building at the start and end of each day. Students again will be have, you know entering in that screening protocol um, when they enter the building and in, in the classroom. Lots of frequent hand washing. Lots of um, uh, sanit sanit sanitizing and um, health practices added being added to our curriculum. One change that is different for us um, from K-12 is our mask policy. Um, MDE guidance states that students five and under do not need to wear a mask when in a preschool program. So our students will not be required to wear masks when they are at school with us. We will be encouraging um, students and families to have them on when they are leaving, um, coming and going out of our building um, when they are traveling as a class um, through the hallways. Um, in conversations with Megan and others, we're feeling fairly confident that the exposure to others will be minimal just in the precautions that um, K3 are making with having lunch in their 
uh, breakfast and lunch in their classrooms and just minimizing that time that um, others are spending in the hallways. Um, classroom spacing, we under both the in-person and hybrid models, um, we will be implementing as much space between students as possible, but also recognizing that our program is social in nature and they need that interaction and ability to, um, to learn those skills, but we will provide as much space as we can um, during that um, pertinent learning time. In a distance learning model, um, we are still in conversations to, to decide what that would look like. Um, we've discussed offering it at a reduced fee um, so that we can continue that learning, continue building those relationships as the year um, progresses. That you know, the challenge with a fee-based fee program comes in not knowing when distance learning may happen or for how long. So um, we're continuing continuing those conversations to. Um, what what will be best for our program and for our students and for um, for our staff as well. The last piece of early childhood I wanted to touch. Oh, I'm going to go back. ECFB I meant to touch on. Um, we're also planning for regular in person delivery um, for our classes that will begin this fall. Um, same thing. Uh, in-person and hybrid would look quite similar. If we had to transition to an um, distance learning model, we would. Um, offer some sort of an, uh, an online um, resource support type of system that I did last spring as well at a reduced rate. Um, it was very flexible for families to have resources that they could utilize, um, opportunities to do Zoom calls with um, early childhood staff, activities and things that they could do at home with their children. And then last is early childhood screenings with the guidance that we received from the state. Um, a week or week and a half ago, we also were given the clearance to presume to proceed with early childhood screenings. It's based on a um, lo the local authority. As long as we are in in person or hybrid models, we can have in person screenings. If at any point we're in a distance learning model, we would have to cancel any um, in person early childhood screenings that were scheduled during that time. So we're currently um, planning um, creating our protocols and procedures that would be in place to ensure that everyone is safe and healthy, scheduling dates. Um, we have about five months worth of screenings to make up since we have not been able to do them since March. Um, so we're working on getting dates um, scheduled so that we can commu communicate those out to families and get screenings um, made up and as quickly a time frame as possible. We'll be kind of prioritizing getting incoming kindergartners and incoming um, four and five year old preschool students screened first if possible and then um, catching up with all of our other three and four year olds that have not accomplished that yet. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you, sir. All right, why the time? All righty. Uh, good afternoon or evening, I should say. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, transportation overall is going to look uh, very similar to previous years. Uh, we are still holding on to 16 routes. We are not adding any, uh, we're not subtracting any, and we are not adding any tiers. Um, so that's going to largely look the same. Uh, we are going to look at working as closely as we can to 50% capacity on the buses, um, but still being mindful of family needs, those that absolutely rely on us uh, for transportation. Um, of course, what that will look like day to day, um, buses will be loaded from back to front. Um, this will help kind of cut out some cross contamination. So first kid on the bus is gonna be always in the back. Last kid's always gonna be in the front when it comes to unloading. Kid in the front's gonna go first and work their way back. Um, so, of course, what that a seating chart will, will be likely, um, and obviously it, it will just work with what the route looks like for that. Um, students and staff, of course, will be wearing masks. Um, we did get clearance uh, just recently from uh, Lieutenant Rue from the uh, Minnesota State Patrol that 
drivers are allowed to wear face shields. Um, the DOT does not have any uh, restrictions against that. Um, so trying to be mindful, some of our drivers do have um, reasonable trouble when it comes to breathing with the masks, so we are trying to work with them. Um, as our drivers are concerned, though, most of them are, we, we really have not had any that have decided to leave out of health concerns, um, which is, we've been very, very grateful for that. Um, they understand the risks, of course, especially being in a more, um, you know, their, their age group for many of them, of course, they're in a high risk uh, group, but um, they've been, very generous in, in helping out. Um, other changes that we have made at our location, um, we did finally just get a shipment of uh, sanit uh, sanitizing, what would you call it, compound, I guess. Um, and uh, we are getting foggers at the end of this week. Um, so it will be uh, tasked on the driver to sanitize after every route. Uh, Connie and I will also be uh, going through them ourselves as sort of an uh, extra la uh, added uh, layer of protection. Um, and let's see. Um, other changes, um, we are complying with some social distancing as well. Um, the break room now uh, looks a lot different. The beloved coffee pot is gone, which I know to a lot of them that's a sad sight to see, but it's, it's a necessary change. So uh, the break room, we've cut out the chairs, uh, coffee pots, where we are trying to encourage drivers to avoid gathering, um, at, at least on our site. And um, otherwise, in, in the future, we, we hope to see some more work with um, getting better information from families on transportation needs, um, looking at something like a um, sort of an opt-in uh, policy, such as you would with um, meal plans and um, and just enrolling in school in general. Um, we have uh, plenty of locations that do this and, and it does help with cutting down uh, waste. Um, you're not sending a bus an extra 16 miles out for one kid that turns out they don't really ride very frequently. Um, so that's uh, part of what we are looking forward to in, in the future. Why, why is that survey? The survey? Well, um, really right now it's between Connie and myself. It's really a two-man operation to try to get the attention of, of all of the families, um, which is, that's, that's where some of the complications come in. Um, you know, we don't have a, a workforce of, you know, 50 plus folks that can help uh, with making those calls, getting in contact, and, and so forth. So really what a, a lot of our locations have is not to put the burden on, on the schools, but that is something that, that the schools tend to get information on. Um, so, so we do have the workforce, and we're going to need to reach out to almost all our families again. Sarah had some information that came in when we did the survey the first time that we think we could go to and then reach out and find out who's going to ride, who can help give rides, so we can try to create as much as possible uh, meet the 50% capacity that's required. Uh, Connie and Wyatt are not going to be able to do that, and we need the information right away so that we can plan accordingly and we can advise families yeah, you can get a ride, but you know your neighbors are also giving kids a ride, so maybe jump into that. Any questions from board? Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you, Wyatt. So uh, we're almost done with our presentations, but I wanted to share that there are a couple things in the governor's directive, their executive order that 
he announced, and that is that we may be able to, each time we switch from one setting to another, he's identified, or they identify in the order that we can take some time to allow the staff to switch uh, and do the things that they need to to get ready. Now they allow five days, that would be like what happened to you last March. We're, we're not thinking, the administrative team has talked to some other staff, we're not thinking we're gonna be around that at all, but we might need a day. When we get that day, they're allowing us to charge that day off to uh, student attendance. So we're not penalized at all, or we're not in a position where that counts against us in any way. The other thing, the reason I have this slide in there is to make sure that you know that if we give technology out to, st to the students, which we have, we're actually looking at doing that in the kindergarten and first grades, that uh, we have to allow them to be able to use the technology for the remainder of the year. You also, I think that Sarah mentioned this in her presentation, but that uh, anybody that says they want to do distance learning has that option. So it's a distance learning option, and they could be in that the entire school year. So as long as they're on our rolls, as long as they're enrolled in our district, then we get the funding and we'll provide, I think, a pretty good quality option to them. Uh, it's not like being in attendance, but it still uh, provides an option to keep them in the district. And I think that you heard earlier today that's about 8 or 9% of our, our population. We want you to know that whenever we get ready to communicate, we're going to do so pretty much across the board. So we'll use the uh, website, school messenger option that we've been using, social media. Uh, and uh, as early as tomorrow, we anticipate, because we promised the community we would try to do this, as early as tomorrow, we anticipate sending a message out that our base plan, if you are OK with this tonight, is going to be to be in-person learning for kindergarten through sixth grade and hybrid learning, according to the information that we'll be posting on our website tomorrow, seven through 12. And then we'll be convening that CITC committee, uh, you know, within the next week, and we'll start making decisions about this as we go forward. We start school September 1, and if you work two, two weeks back from that, we have to make a drop dead decision by September or by August 18th. But we need to, we feel like people want to know what are you intending right now? And so we'll, we'll be sending that message out tomorrow. Uh, Mark and Lisa are here. And if you could make a few comments on where you're at with technology and equipment, uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this will be pretty quick. Um, webcams, we ordered them and just received them. Um, every classroom will have a webcam. Uh, what I envision uh, is putting it like on your smartphone, somewhere where the, if the kid's at home, they can somewhat participate and see some of the classmates. Um, Google Meet, we are planning to, Google Meet was free in the spring. Um, it is no longer free. As of September 30th, it is no longer free. I don't believe Zoom is free anymore um, from what I've been seeing. So we're getting a quote to purchase the enterprise version of Google Meet, which will allow us to continue to re do recordings, um, stream, some other features, but big, the big one is the recordings that the high school folks want. Um, document cameras, all the equipment is, is hard to get in it's as well as the other industries. Um, we have ordered document cameras, the elementary school, three quarters plus already have them, but we're ordering for, for all the other staff and the order has been purchased. Uh, we've been told it should arrive the first week in September to them and then ship to us. So we're not going to have them on day one, but we'll soon have them after that. That'll allow them to show different uh, pieces of paper or booklets that they're looking at um, that they didn't have in the spring. Uh, student devices, we are set with student devices. Right now the plan is if, if, if we have to send in devices for kindergarten and first graders, uh, the third grade uh, students would probably get Chromebooks. We have more of those than iPads. This, this is the plan if we don't have to purchase anything, or so we don't have to purchase anything. And then the third grade iPads would go down to the first and kindergartners to, uh, su to, to support the rest of the students. They already have some in those grades, um, but that would allow us to have every student to have a device to be able to take home. Um, the last point is the media center transition. 
Um, they are making five classrooms, I believe, at this point out of the out of the media center, condensing the books into a smaller area, and then uh, the five different classrooms will have a TV so they can present something. It's not going to be a smart board, but uh, something visual so that the kids can see what the teacher is wanting to look at at a certain time. Uh, attention wall is what they're calling them now. Yeah, that is about all I have. Do you have a rough estimate of dollar value? Uh, We're actually going to get to that in a couple of minutes, but if you've got a thing just for technology, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I'll just go down the list here. Webcams, I think they were 16 bucks a piece. We bought 90. Uh, Google Meet, we don't know, um, but from talking with other districts, uh, I believe that's going to be a few thousand dollars, five, six thousand dollars. Document cameras, there were none available. The one vendor that came back that said they're getting in September. Um, Epson model, uh, $173, I think it was, for, for uh, 75 of them. Uh, student devices. Well, the media center, the, the five TVs, we're looking to get like Walmart kid out $600 TV on a stand. So around $700 for those five. And that is at this point what we're planning to purchase for COVID related things. Um, similar to a webcam, but it's, it's just, it's got an arm on it and it allows you to put anything underneath it. It's, it's like a, a new overhead projector. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's attached to your computer. So when they share their screen, the kids at home can see it. <laughs> You remember the mimeograph too, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, thanks, thanks Mark. Mark. Yeah, thank you. And Mark and Lisa have been working on re, uh, reconstituting the media center. I also just have this slide in so that uh, the board would know that uh, we do have labor agreements in the district. Districts have to provide accommodations to staff who. Uh, may have either themselves or members of their home be in an at-risk situation. So we do have a few folks that we're working with on that. Uh, we think for the most part with the teaching staff that we're, we're gonna be really in good shape. Got um, a couple of the people that have identified that as a concern. Uh, we're gonna be able to ask them to be on, uh, online or distance learning providers. And that's gonna work out pretty nicely. Um, at WIM, there are some uh, concerns that we have that we're just becoming aware of, so we'll have to see how that goes. But the executive order says we have to figure something out, so we're very aware of that, and we want you to be. Also, I know that uh, one of the things the state did that was great last spring was they allowed us to repurpose special, special education uh, staff, especially paraprofessionals. So since we didn't have those kids in attendance, there are other things that we could do with some of those staff members that were productive and added value to the district. Uh, at the state level, we were able to do that with the state revenues, but we don't get nearly these special education state revenue as compared to what we get with the federal government. And you know that the federal bill is tied up in the legis in the uh, in Congress. There's they're discussing three trillion or one trillion. And uh, once they get that done, we're hoping that they give us relief along those lines so we can do what makes sense locally. Ted asked a question a minute ago that uh, I, I am anticipating all of you have been thinking about, like, holy smokes, we're talking about some additional costs here, and we certainly are. This is kind of a collection of information that is, that's been talked about, the temperature kiosk, but we have to be able, they're going to be kind of spending but we have to be able to move people through rapidly. So in a very efficient way, otherwise we're gonna end up when it starts snowing with kids standing in a line and we can't even get them in the building. We are, uh, uh, Scott talked about room dividers. I think that Sarah may need some of those as well, rugs for the floor. We're gonna need some cafeteria tables to be able to accommodate what uh, all Corey and Janine and Paulette said they need. A face mask, Corey's done a good job of this. We're getting several hundred face masks from the Department of Education. Some will be shields, some will be face masks. But uh, Corey, uh, we don't want to be short of those things, and we anticipate we're going to need them for most of the year. So there's going to be an ample supply of those that's been ordered and that we're already receiving. 
Mark talked about document cameras, webcams, and TVs. And the TV screens, we might need to provide for the middle school teaching staff and perhaps the high school staff. And this is a blown up screen, so if we're gonna be doing distance learning, we can do it in a quality way. We can actually see the kids on them instead of looking at a computer screen. I mean, we have an obligation to provide a quality distance learning uh, program, uh, an option for those folks that choose it. And so our teachers are saying to us, you know, we gotta be able to see people then. And we're in agreement. All the things down to technology that are one-time purchases, as I'm looking at it. And, and you guys are all business people or in the business world, so you know that we have some dollars that we can make one-time purchases with. The concerns we have going forward are always going to be about what it has sales. So that gets us to the next column there on staffing. <clears throat> and right now we anticipate this 0.5 FTE K3 teacher that um, Scott talked about. And that's really going to be a full-time person for a half a year, as he explained. And then we're going to see if we hire somebody for the full year and we're able to bring everybody back in, then, you know, we're... We have staff that uh, we have to fit in. In this case, it's gonna be more efficient. If we have to renew that at mid-year, we'll know that. Uh, and also, we're gonna need a, a full-time paraprofessional, we think, so that Scott in the elementary school can make sure we're serving, serving those kids in the best way possible, whether they're in attendance or at home. And then Corey's talked about a couple half-time positions. I don't know if they'll be half-time, but there's gonna be some hours because we're going to have to clean this place, you know, in a limited amount of time. That's not what your staff is hired for. Uh, they, they can work very hard, but they can't cover all the space. So we're looking for some flexibility here. And uh, I'm going to say, Ted, that all this stuff is going to cost, the, the stuff on the top might be up to $100,000, but we're going to need it anyway. And if we don't use it right now, it'll be there. So if we get 20 TV screens at $250 a screen, I mean, if we can keep one kid in the district, that's gonna cover the cost of that. So these aren't exorbitant numbers. And, and we have a budget right now where we've received, as you know, that ESSER money, the federal money from last year that has been earmarked and left alone for this. We also have Vicki Health and Safety, or what was the account? Yeah, so so we're anticipating we have $150,000, $160,000. Not that we want to spend it, but that's available. So that's not cutting into your current budget, uh, which, you know, we, we know Chip, Chip talked about that number 12, 1280, I think. So we're really focused on how can we get 1,280 kids enrolled or more. And then uh, I just want to make sure everybody knows we're doing these things because we're in these COVID times. So when we come out of this, we, we don't anticipate carrying that staff forward. So it's, it's not seasonal, but it's temporary in regard to uh, COVID. I think one thing that we could be facing over time is, I think our unions might say, you know, on, all, all staff on deck is one thing, but can we identify these are the things you're asking us to do during these times? So I don't think that we should be surprised if we get a request to sign some kind of a, this does not present a precedent um, document. And I think we should endorse that because our staff's been terrific about stepping up and uh, that, that assurance seems to be reasonable to me. Um, in the end, all this stuff we've talked about, is going to be on these two sheets um, that are in your packet tonight. And I think if you go to that page uh, six and seven in your packet, because people are going to want to know what does hybrid mean? And so they're going to want to see the A and the B and the cleaning day and how that all works. And then we're going to get a three day week. How is that going to work? Then we're going to get a four day week. So we just got to work hard to convince the community. They got to roll with us on some of these things. But make no mistake, I think across the board with the principals, with all the leaders that have been meeting, this is not going to be the distance learning program we had last spring. This is going to be ramped up. It's going to be rigorous. 
and the expectations are we're going to give you a credit after you complete all the work but if you don't complete the work you're not making progress toward graduation and i think that's what parents expect that's why we have a 21 million dollar budget and these are the times that we're in right now so we got to work hard to make sure that folks understand whether you're here or whether you're uh, at home learning there's going to be high expectations and rigor because you're actually learning uh, what our pacing guides and what our essential learner outcomes say you're supposed to be. So I want to make sure you guys understand this is not a pretty package yet, but it's a framework for moving forward. And tomorrow we'll be able to tell our public, because they've been calling us regularly, what are you going to do? And we'll say, uh, as of this date, the board has given a nod of approval to moving forward with on-site learning K6 and uh, hybrid learning in the form that you can find on our website, grades seven through 12. I apologize for the length of this meeting. There's been a lot of presenters, as you can already see, there's a lot of moving parts in this whole thing. And uh, our, our staff, again, when you see them, I hope not only these people, but especially our teachers, They've stepped up. They'll be in here tomorrow in mass again, a lot of them getting ready for the start of the school year. So uh, everybody seems to be part of the, the uh, family that you guys are very proud of, and, and we've been you know, touting those. Send that out to them. Yeah. Yeah, this is what we're going to roll out as it is today. It's going to be reassessed at, at okay. whatever interval just because people don't want to, I don't want parents to feel like that's going to be blocked. Yeah. They don't help prisoners or until the whole year. That's a great suggestion. So we'll, we'll make a, that a heavy point that here's how we're starting, but this could be adjusted each week. Yeah. And so we're reassessing every week. Yeah. yeah. We need to prepare. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to echo that, but um, I want to thank everybody from the top to the bottom. You know, there's been a ton of work that's gone in the last couple of weeks. We probably only know a pinch of it because we heard a little bit tight, but I, I want to thank, starting with you, everybody, everybody how they've dug in, and it, it really makes me proud on how everybody is digging in and moving forward. That means a lot. Flexibility and adaptability outside of the what a contract explicitly states. Uh, we're seeing that across the board, all of us have. They all need to be commended. Everybody stepped up to meet the challenge and overcome the mess. Yes, good work for everybody. What right. are comments? Thank you. So I'll, I'll be convening, Chad, if you're okay, I'll be convening that team that uh, you, you saw being proposed tonight, plus uh, the, I think it was Mr. Livingston, was it Livingston? With the hospital. Oh. There, there were two people that were suggested. One was the police chief. Emergency management. County yeah. emergency manager. Okay. 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 So we'll add those two to the list then, and we'll try to get a, a meeting convened for next week. I don't think that meeting will be more than two hours long. <laughs> okay. Anything further on that topic? Not where I'm looking to go to the green, but all the policies. Thank you. Please come up. Please email us. Emails. Announcements. You know, I had uh, the district leadership committee call this Monday. Anyone else have that other calendar? I think we did, but we moved it to the August session. Okay. Right. That was my understanding that we uh, we needed to convene those folks to get a start to get a read so on this the public. This was the second. Okay. Very good. So we've got the regular meeting next Monday. Uh, any other items? We're done. We're looking for a motion to adjourn at 7 minutes. First, this is your second. Second. Agile. Anything further? Say nothing. Uh, I'll take a shot. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everybody, for the work. Thank you, guys. Good job. Thank you. Good job. 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 Good job.